And there we are. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, after a, a very successful day one, we're kicking off our Wednesday session. Uh, this 10 minutes is just uh, you know brief introductions and announcements again. Uh, wanted to give everyone an overview of what today's um, what today's schedule is going to look like. So, the very very basic for us today. Um, so we have our, our intros and announcements here in the beginning, and then at fourteen fifteen UTC we are going to begin the first of uh, today's committees, uh, which is going to be our education committee. Uh, chaired by Dr. Shannon Schmall of the Abrams Planetarium at Michigan State University in Michigan, USA. Uh, and with her will be uh, Drs. Jenny Shipway and Sarah Schultz. Uh, and you can see an introduction to education research from Dr. Shipway and a mini workshop on assessment conversations uh, with uh, Dr. Schultz. And so this should be a, a fantastic uh, overview of, of some of the work that the edu education committee is doing and then some of the, the professional development that can uh, they'll be along with that. At 1600 UTC, we've got a, a, a half hour break in networking. So uh, feel free to um, stick around and enjoy that time. And then our second half of today's VCon is the membership committee report with our chair, Mike Murray uh, from Delta College Planetarium in Michigan, USA. And then finally, uh, the science and data visualization task force which is chaired by Dr. Mark Subarau, and we'll have a, a number of, um, of presenters during that, Thomas Jarrett and Tom and Lars Lindbergh and Mark as well. Uh, and then uh, today afterwards from 1800 to, let's say about 1930 UTC, the room will remain open for networking and hospitality. So do feel, feel free if you're able to, uh, to stick around and enjoy that time with your colleagues today. But, uh, in the next uh, few minutes, since we do want to remain on time and uh, uh, cognizant of those who might be jumping in and out of the virtual conference today, uh, if there's any, uh, if there are any um, questions or comments, uh, I will put in the chat the link to the day one proceedings on YouTube. Uh, that will also go out on the IPS Planetarium uh, Facebook page, and then the Dome Dialogues Facebook page as well. Uh, but that's up, and by the end of the day, you'll see a, uh, a full clickable link um, schedule on the description so that you can go and jump to each of the individual times for the, the, the sessions and for the presentations. So I'll let, uh, I'll stop that share so that we can, everybody can see everyone else in the room. Uh, but yeah, uh, if there's um, you know, anything to discuss in, the, in our brief uh, five, six minutes before the education committee begins, uh, do please feel free. Do we, do we have any new members? Somebody who's joined in the last year. Yeah, if you are a new member, please feel free to unmute and uh, introduce yourselves or stay in the background and not introduce yourselves. Like we, we, are, we are an organization that respects that, but uh, uh, do feel free. We're, 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 we're relatively friendly, like across the whole board. Hello. Um, hello. Hello. My name is uh, Marie, and I just joined. Uh, I'm a new member. I joined uh, last week, <laughs> right on time for, for this uh, this presentation. So um, I'm working at Felix and Paul Studio, and we do um, show for domes. And um, I started five, six weeks ago. So I'm, I'm brand new in this, uh, in this business. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear everything you have to say in this, uh, in this conference. It's all, it's all brand new information for me. And it's really instructive. Wonderful. Welcome. Oh, 
Well, since there's some dead air time, I have a question I'd like to put out there. Has anyone figured out how to do ticket lists online or online ticketing for their planetarium? And I'm ideally looking for an open source or close to free solution. We've been using Eventbrite, which I don't think is free, um, but we are able to use it for free through our university. So they have a whole thing, um, but it's been, um, it's the first time we've used it since we've reopened and it's been really um, nice so far. Yeah, Eventbrite's very popular. Sadly, the uh, I don't know what they're charging in university, but the charge per ticket is pretty high, especially when planetariums tend to have pretty low priced admission fees. Okay, so I'll check that out. Thanks, Jim. I see a question in the chat of, has anyone seen the Perseids? We've been having a lot of thunderstorms, so not a lot of clear nights lately for us, but I hope to. Hello, can anybody hear me? Uh, yeah, the cloudy skies down here in Texas too. Hey, that question about the online ticketing thing got me thinking, uh, does anybody know of any freely available resource for online reservation uh for, it's like group for group scheduling just curious this is bruce from texas We have seen a little bit of the Percy's, but we have so much smoke, fire smoke, and they're cutting down on the viewing. So you guys in Texas have clouds, got the smoke. And I'm sure many of you have experienced the smoke in your area. So uh, you have Oregon to think more on that. Yeah, no smoke here. Just, just, just um, Fred Ben here. Just very quickly, um, somebody's looking for a sign-up system that's free. I just, I just want to throw it in there. Um, sign-up Genius is free. They have, they, you know, they have their own advertising, and you know, they pay for themselves. But it is a free way for signups to happen. Again, sign-up Genius. Sorry. Thank you so much. I'll check it out. All right, well, we are uh, right on time for this morning. And uh, to kick us off for the second VCon day, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the Education Committee and the Chair of the Education Committee, Dr. Shannon Schmall. Shannon, floor is yours. 
I will unmute. Hooray, I remembered. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Shannon Schmoll. Um, like Michael had said before, I'm at the Abrams Planetarium at Michigan State University in the United States and uh, chair of the Education Committee. I um, took over being chair about a year ago from Jeannie Bishop, who had uh, led the committee for, for many, many years. Um, and so I uh, am happy to share with you all uh, what we've been up to in the past year, trying to work remotely via Zoom during the pandemic as you know, we all do. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen in a second. Let me bring up the right thing. I have too many tabs open. Okay, there we go. So I just wanna start with an overview of, of the committee. Um, and if you are interested in joining, there will be several times where I mention that throughout. So we would love to have you on the education committee. Um, so this is our committee function. You can find this on the IPS website um, for on the education committee web uh, on the page. I've highlighted just a couple things I wanna point out um, throughout overall our, our function is to engage in projects that enhance planetarium education worldwide. Um, so what can we do to make sure that we are utilizing our planetariums to the best of our abilities? And how do we um, do that in a way that also taps into the diverse talents within our field? We have people who are educators and have a background in education. We have technicians. We have people who've been doing this for, for years and have found out a lot of really fantastic um, best practices. And we want to be able to share all of those as we go forward. So that is our function, is to try to do that in different ways. Um, these are our goals. Uh, again, highlighting some key things here. Um, we want to emphasize international participation. We are an international organization, and so we do want to try to emphasize that. So um, I think we, as IP, um, the Education Committee follows the IPS organization similarly in that we tend to heavily lean towards North America. So we would definitely like to see um, more international participation on the committee as well. Um, we want to collect information about astronomy education and then disseminate that as well. So how do we get that out to everybody so we all have the best information possible when educating in our domes? Um, and then that will also help us show how important the planetarium is in astronomy education and as you'll see beyond as well. Um, and I think very key to this is we want to encourage educational research in planetariums. There's been some really great educational research um, that involves planetariums. You're going to hear about some of that today. Um, but we also want to encourage a lot more. Um, I think planetariums have been overlooked when it comes to education research for a long time. Um, and I think we can we want to try to build that up. Um, and we will participate in IPS sessions. And that's what we're doing today. So hooray, we're, we're meeting a goal. Um, so um, these are our members. You can see who's on there. Um, and so we, again, we would love to, to have you join us um, and uh, make this list a little bigger. So this is who's already there, but we would love to have more folks as well. Um, again, you can find everyone's contact information and where they are in the world on the IPS Education Committee page. Um, okay, so this is our structure. Give me one second. I'm going to go close the door because we're going to have a bunch of kindergartners coming out here pretty soon. So one second. So the committee structure is something that we've been sort of figuring out um, a lot in the in the past year. We've been trying to sort of restructure it slightly into subcommittees, because when we talk about education and planetarium education, that's a big task. Um, and so we, um, there, and there's a lot of different aspects of that. And so we wanted to be able to sort of address those different things. Um, and so initially we thought, well, maybe audience, maybe we break this down by audience. So we have folks who maybe focus more on, on um, younger students in formal education settings. Maybe we talk, we have someone talking more about like adult programming. Uh, but ultimately, like there's a lot of overlap in the methods. 
there. And so what the committee um, ended up deciding on is we have three subcommittees that we want to sort of, or three main areas that we focus on within education. The first would be the classic concept. So what planetariums are known for? So this is the astronomy and the physics. Um, topics that we can teach, the things that planetariums have been teaching since the dawn of planetariums a hundred years ago, as we know, that's coming up. Um, the other one is the broader topics. So as we move into a new era, I, I, I think we're moving into a really great era of planetariums, at least, where we're able to teach things well beyond astronomy and that more those more classic concepts. With uh, We can teach um, about climate change, for instance, and there's been a lot of great work um, by folks on trying to use planetariums to teach climate change, but also teaching art, um, teaching history, architecture. Um, with digital domes, we are able to take people into the ocean and travel around the world. So what are sort of those broader topics that we can utilize planetariums for and educate and things that we haven't traditionally used planetariums for, but we are starting to and how do we find the best practices there? And then there's a research group. And this is something that's going to cover pretty much anything we talk about with the planetarium, but we do really want to be able to promote and disseminate education research. Um, and we want to make sure that whatever we are doing is based in evidence from education research. And so that's really something that we've been trying to push a lot more within this committee is, um, is that educational research component. Um, so just keeping an eye on time here. All right, so what we've been working on, I would say the most in the past year has been our dissemination side of things. So how are we getting the word out and in what ways are we getting the word out? Um, and we have a column. So the education committee has a column called Seeking What Works in the Planetarian. Uh, so you can, if you have a copy of it, you can go find it. There's my copy right here. Um, so go check that out. So this is something that Jeannie wrote for many, many years um, and has written many great articles. And I have also now taken on that, that mantle and written a couple of them. But one of the things that I wanted to use with that uh, column when I took over was make this a space for more voices. Um, so we've been um, sort of splitting that column up among committee members, um, taking on different topics, different ways of talking about education, and also trying to make sure that there is a more international voice within that column. Um, Jeannie is from North America, I'm from North America, so I wanted to make sure that we are also getting um, other voices into the planetarian in this sort of set space that we already have. Um, so this is, um, for instance, one that, that I wrote that was around gender and learning. Oh, I just noticed a typo there. Um, so this was uh, sort of expanding on the nuances around uh, gender and learning. Um, and then Simonetta Arcoli from Italy uh, then took it over and talked about the pandemic um, and the response of Italian planetariums to the pandemic. Um, and Italy was a very hard hit country, as we know, very early on. So talking about how the planetarians um, in Italy sort of uh, continued their missions. Ken Brandt is another one of our members and he uh, wrote something on Zoom. So we've been very pandemic focused as, as we um, in the past year, of course. So he uh, talked to a lot of other planetarians to see what people were learning about teaching on Zoom and in a virtual environment and what were the best practices um, that seemed to be coming out uh, from all of this and sort of uh, wrote that down. So we have that here. And then next issue is uh, Jenny Shipway, who you'll be hearing from today as well, who's going to be writing about misconceptions that we have around how people learn. So there's a lot of ideas on how people learn. Um, and some of those ideas aren't um, actually backed up by the research. And so she's going to explore what is the, the research base for the different ways that people learn. And so I know that's been sent out. It's a great article. Um, so I would encourage you guys to check that out in the next issue of the Planetarian. Um, 
Speaking of Dr. Jenny Shipway, um, she's also now has her own new column in the Planetarian um, called Danger Misconceptions Ahead. And so this came out of a lot of different conversations the committee was having around addressing uh, astronomy misconceptions uh, and how the diagrams that we use or the visualizations that we use to explain these ideas might contribute to misconceptions. Because um, sometimes diagrams are really helpful Sometimes they're really helpful if you already understand what's going on. And so um, originally we thought maybe this could be a monthly thing. So we called this misconception of the month that could go into the uh, newsletter that gets emailed out, uh, but realized that more space was needed than what the newsletter would really allow. And so this is now a new column within the planetarium. So each issue, a new topic will be explored. This is an introduction to misconceptions and what they are in this first issue. The next um, issue is talking about, oh, I'm forgetting, is it the moon, Jenny? Yeah, I'm completely spacing right now. <laughs> the one after this is the moon, yeah. Oh, the, yes, the one after this is the moon. So talking about the moon and the diagrams that we use for teaching about that. So this is a way that we're getting, again, research-based ideas around how to teach concepts um, out to our members um, and filled with lots of fun images here, so. Um, do check those out. Um, um, oh yes, thank you, Mark. So um, Mark also, I didn't have, I don't have pictures of this, but Mark also has his own column, Mark Percy, who's one of our members, um, who has a column called um, the Class Dome. So do um, check that out as well. Mark, do you wanna maybe say a few words about that column? Um, well, it's it's actually leading a group of people. Um, we've got our class dome cadre. Uh, Sharon Shanks was smart enough not to ask me to do the whole thing by myself because I probably would have chickened out. But uh, with with my group, we talk about things that affect actual, you know, in more of a classroom type setting use of the planetarium. Ooh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Quick thinking. Yes, under under the class dome. Um, so that's something that Mark Mark leads. So he just talked about that. So we a, another great way to kind of think about this and how the planetarium works in different settings, different types of education. So again, education is a really big topic. Um, and so, and I'm gonna maybe put you on the spot again here, Mark, in just a moment. Um, these are some current projects, as well as some ideas that we might be pursuing down the road. I hope to have a, a meeting with the committee here again sometime in the fall so we can sort of plan out our next steps now that we've kind of gotten all of these um, new projects sort of up and running. So Mark is leading a project um, called The Earth, which is a new planetarium show that the committee has been um, sort of giving feedback on. Mark, do you want to say anything about that? or? you want me to not? <laughs> no, I'll be happy to. Um, so those of you who have used uh, audiovisual Imagineering's The Moon <clears throat> and The Weather shows um, would know more what I'm talking about, but I, I have found those shows to be absolutely excellent. Um, the interactivity with the kids works wonderfully. The teachers love them. Um, but faced with the next generation science standards, I'm seeing a lot of things in the early elementary grades that we have not traditionally taught. So what I did is I, I kind of brainstormed with a couple of other people and we came up with a list of stuff that we would like to teach in the same sort of format. And um, I wrote a rough introductory script for the first part of the show and got a bunch of feedback and then the pandemic you know, this was actually the beginning of the pandemic when we were all sort of like, well, what do we do now? But then life came along and took my attention away. So it's it's been kind of sitting since then. But um, hopefully we will eventually produce a script and a, a storyline for a third show in that series, um, <clears throat> which would would cover things like how the Earth we, to seasons and um, changes to the Earth's surface, other things that we see in the, the United States um, Next Generation Science Standards. And just quickly while I got the floor, 
you were talking about more, a more international flavor. Um, I'm also looking for that with the class dome column as well. It's very US centric at this point, but anybody who's working in a more of a classroom type setting with that rather than a public uh, public communication setting, please feel free to contact me and join in. Um, whatever cool things you're doing that, that work for you in that setting, we'd love to hear about it and share it with the rest of the community. All right, so we, we are about, thank you, Mark, very much for that. Um, I'm going to just wrap up. You can see some of these project ideas that we have here. Um, and if you do want to join, you can email me. We're also going to give you a survey at the end. So if you are interested in joining us or the class dome column, you can note that in the survey, but I'm gonna send it over to Dr. Chipway now. So Jenny, you wanna take it away? Thank you very much. So let me share my screen. And here we are. So I want to just give really a bit of an introduction to education research, especially for anyone who is new to this area, because I think we all do our own evaluation. But there's this whole world of academics, of psychologists and sociologists and education researchers who have done so many amazing studies and discovered so many really useful things that it's really useful just to try to engage a little bit in that world. So my talk's gonna break down into four parts. I'm gonna give a little bit of an introduction just into the world of education research and then talk about different types of learning that I'll be discussing today. And the main focus of my talk is on cognitive load theory. So some of you I'm sure will have heard of this before, others not. It's very easy to understand and not unintuitive um, theory for how the brain works. And the great thing about it is that not only is it quite easy to understand at a basic level, but also it leads naturally to practical tips for how you can then support your learners. So to start off with the world of education research, um, the way that you would hope this would work is you'd have these researchers and they would present lovely evidence-based new information and we would hear it and then we would change our practice in response. Now, it doesn't always happen like that. And education research is interesting. It's almost more like they're communicating, some, communicating something like climate change rather than astronomy, for instance, because it turns out there are a whole load of other factors that get in the way of this process. Um, not only the actual communication itself, and there is a bit of a gap, which people talk about now and are trying to fill. This talk is my attempt to try to broach this gap between research and practice. But it's also quite an emotional area and everyone has an instinct for what they believe works from perhaps their own educational experience. And there are politics. And what often happens is that rather than a neat change in practice, what you actually get is something a little bit more like this. So if you go into Twitter and go into edu Twitter, you'll find lots of people shouting at each other. Um, what I find is quite often they're actually using different definitions of words. They're talking about different contexts, different types of learning. And I think they probably just enjoy arguing. But if you go into this world, just be prepared for lots of very passionate people um, you'll get wonderfully charismatic, evangelistic people who will tell you all sorts of things, but just stay wary, go back to the primary sources, keep a cool head, and if something sounds wonderful, always look for a counter-argument as well. So, like I say, one of the problems is I think people don't often define exactly what they're talking about, so that's what I'm going to do now before I start on the educational research, um, because there are very different types of learning out there. When I say learning, what I'm really talking about is we put a human being with a brain into some experience that we give them in our dome, and we hope that in some way their brain is changed at the end of this. And we might have all different objectives for our show. So here in the UK, we tend to break objectives down into five groups. Um, maybe we, we're trying to teach them to understand a concept, but maybe we want them to go home and do something like look at the stars. 
Maybe we want to change their emotional response to something, their values or their skills. Um, these are all really different things, but I'm going to be talking specifically about understanding. So this is about learning concepts and knowledge. Now, within that, there's different ways of learning as well. So one way to divide learning up is into biologically primary and biologically secondary learning. This is my nephew, Alan, who is demonstrating each. So biologically primary learning is what happens if you get a small child and put them on a beach in a foreign country. What they do is they dig around in the undergrowth and they find interesting things and they ask you about them and they just sponge up all this information. It's like the human brain is primed to learn about its environment, what's good to eat, what's dangerous, and things like speaking as well. You don't need to teach a child how to speak. They just sponge it up from being in an environment where people around them are talking. So this is like the play-based learning, um, discovery learning that we do most often with young children. And then the other type is biologically secondary. And this is Alan again, a few years later, and he's learning to write the Chinese word for the word carrot. And Chinese is his second language, and he does not like learning to write Chinese. And he doesn't like it because it's effortful. He has to make mental effort. He needs to concentrate. His mother needs to show him how to do it. He needs to follow her instructions. And there are things that you don't learn from biologically primary learning. Um, he could walk around, you know, people walk around in cities with writing all around them, yet remain illiterate if they don't have the opportunity to learn to write and read. You have to make an effort to learn it. So this is writing, trigonometry, um, a lot of astrophysics. These are the things that we learn at school and you're not gonna sponge them up from a rich environment. You actually need to sit down and make an effort. And that's what I'm talking about. And one more definition only um, is the type of memories I'm trying to make. And you can divide memory into episodic and semantic memories. And episodic is just like when you remember being somewhere. So it's like replaying a film in your head it's very sensory rich. Maybe you remember going to a bar and you can remember the smell of it, the way the wood dug into your front as you leant forward to try to hear the barman, the sweetness of the drink. And you can almost replay it like a film in your mind. But the other type of memory is semantic. And this is like little nuggets of information. So perhaps when you're at the bar, someone told you that the bar closed at midnight. But in the end, you just kind of know this if you go there regularly. You don't have to replay the film in your head each time to access that bit of information, to remember someone telling you that. It becomes a little standalone fact. And in that type, as a semantic memory, it's much more useful. You can pull on it and use it in different ways much more easily. And that is the type of memory I'm talking about. So to recap, I'm talking about knowledge. The sort of knowledge that you actually have to make a mental effort to learn and that knowledge in the form of little individual nuggets rather than a big rich memory, emotional memory. And having established that, I'm going to move on to cognitive load theory, which is really, really useful. If you don't know this, you should know about cognitive load theory. And it explains about how humans learn. And the great thing is whichever country you're in, this is going to work for you because it's just about the human brain. And going inside the human brain, the first thing I should make very clear is that nobody knows how it works. So I'm not going to tell you how the brain works, how neurons interact. No one really knows how it happens. And what it is not is it is not like a computer. So people use computers as analogies, but really it's very different. It's very distributed and complex in ways we don't understand. But I'm gonna give you a model to think about it. And here is a thought. So say this is an apple. When I say apple, what does your brain do? Well, it has some sort of pattern of activity within it, which in some way encodes the idea of an apple. And that might include the weight of it, the size, the smell, the taste, um, everything you know about an apple, all the different things are all bound up and they're all interconnected to create this whole. 
And these interconnections between, are really important for how the brain works. Everything is connected to everything else. So when you learn something new, it needs to be connected as well. You can't have a new standalone thought. So the only way to learn something is to connect it to something that's already in your brain. And it may well be co-opting parts of other ideas and linking to them and borrowing them and changing them. But you can't just have it floating all by itself. It will always interact and interconnect and overlap with things that are already in there. So to get to the actual model I'm going to show you, um, we're trying to get stuff into people's long-term memories. This is our aim. We want to get it in there so that they can pull it out again at will. But you can't just like inject a memory into someone's head. Even if you could somehow electrically affect their brain, you wouldn't know what was already in there and how to connect it. So the only thing we can do is affect the outside world. So everything we do goes in through their senses. And the actual process of learning is happening entirely within their head. And we don't have so much control over that. We can only control the outside environment. And when we give something to this learner, what they do is they take it into what's called their working memory. And the working memory is not a chunk of brain. It's not a place, but it's a kind of capacity of the brain. It's distributed. It doesn't live in one particular place. But they have a capacity to take information in. And this is like a short-term memory store where they can put things while they're processed. And in that processing, they can also retrieve information from their long-term memory to be processed and help that. And then once they've got a new thought, a new idea, a new way of thinking, they can then encode that back into their long-term memory as well. And it's the act of thinking and turning things over, which will then help them encode it. Um, so this is the model I'm going to be using for my talk. And I'll give you a concrete example now, just to kind of explain perhaps a little more clearly. So imagine if you had a small child and you told them that a tiger is a cat with stripes. Now, this child knows what a cat is. They have one at home. They know what stripes are. They have blue and purple striped pajamas, but they've never heard the word tiger. It's just a sound to them. So when you say a tiger is a cat with stripes, they take this into their working memory. But the words cat and the word stripes call upon these rich ideas they already have in their long term memory. So they can retrieve the meaning of cat and the meaning of stripes, pull that into their working memory. And then they're processing their concept of a cat with their concept of stripes and this new word tiger. And they can process this to make this new idea of a tiger being a cat with stripes. And then, of course, they can encode that into their long term memory. And because everything is connected, it will connect and overlap with their concepts for cat and their concepts for stripes, which is great, because if you say, name me a stripy animal, then it all connects really easily. And then next time they hear the word tiger, it's not just a sound now. They can pull this concept back out of their long-term memory. And every time they pull it out, it's going to be easier. They're learning how to retrieve it. And the more often they retrieve it, the better they'll get at retrieving it. I'm sure we've all put things in our long-term memories and then completely lost the ability to pull them out again. Our long-term memories are huge and they're just full of loads of stuff we can't access anymore. So practicing retrieving memories is really important to the learning process. Ooh, I wasn't going to show you that yet. I'm forgetting my own talk. Um, I was just going to say that every time, although at first she may have a very simplistic idea of what a tiger is, each time she then encounters a tiger in a TV show or in the zoo, she would adapt and improve and enrich that until by the time she's an adult like you, when I say the word tiger, you do get this much richer and more complex idea that will come to your mind. But just from that one word in your working memory, you get all of that. So one thing to notice from this is that prior knowledge is really, really important. If she hadn't known what a cat was, she could not have done that. And I want to do a little experiment on you now. 
to, to have you observe your own brains. So I'm going to show you a picture and I'm going to give you just 10 seconds or something. And don't kind of concentrate and think really hard, but just observe what your brain does when you see this picture. And it will be different for different ones of you. So here you go. Now, different people will have different reactions. Some people will immediately know what this is and pull it out of their long-term memory very easily. Other people may not know what it is, but they may have been able to work it out because they had enough prior knowledge to be able to do that. Um, or if you're like me, perhaps, you would look at it and go, what on earth is that? And I saw this on Twitter when I was preparing my first version of this talk. And what my brain did was it went, what on earth is it? And I could feel my brain hunting for where can I put this? Um, is it a soft toy? Is it a tiny hippo? Is it a giant mole? And I was so confused because my brain didn't know where to link it. Everything has to be linked. And I expect that I can't see the chat box. So I, I desperately want to know if people know what it is and can say what it is. Um, but what it is, is it's something called a skinny pig, which is a hairless skinny pig. So <laughs> that's what it is. And different people will have had different reactions because they had different prior knowledge. So for anyone who knows what a guinea pig is, they've got this concept of a guinea pig already. So they just stick it together with the idea of bald. And that's very straightforward. If anyone didn't know what a guinea pig is, it's going to be more difficult. They have all these different ideas that they need to put together all at the same time to create this concept. So if you've got more prior knowledge, it's going to be easier for you to learn new things because you've got more places to connect them and it just simplifies it all. So this idea is called cognitive load. How much stuff, how much load do you have crammed into your working memory at any one time? And it turns out to be unbelievably important because working memory is the learning bottleneck. This is the tight point when you're trying to get information into someone's long-term memory. Their long-term memory is vast beyond comprehension, but you can only fit a very limited amount of information into their working memory at one time. And once you know that, it kind of makes sense of a lot of techniques I think people use instinctively. And the tips I'm going to give you for managing cognitive load, I think a lot of them will be things you do already. But hopefully this model will give you an explanation for why and just help you do it maybe more mindfully. So practical tips. First, I'll show you um, cognitive overload. This is what it looks like. So I'll read this out. Um, it says, you see a banana shaped crescent moon when you can only see a small part of the half of the moon that is lit by the sun. So imagine if someone didn't know what a moon phase was and you said this to them. Um, it makes sense, but even me, when I read that, by the time I get to the end of it, I've forgotten the beginning already. It's just too much all at once to be trying to process all these different parts of it. So what I'm sure you would do naturally is to break it up into manageable chunks. And this is called chunking. Um, so the idea is to break up concepts so that each little step has a manageable amount of things in working memory. So you're processing it a little bit at a time. If you try to put too much in one processing chunk, it's just not gonna work. And the, the important thing here as well is that when you do these steps, you can't just go step, 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 because that's almost as bad. So what you wanna do is do one step, let them process it, and let them think around it a little bit. Let them think of it in a couple of different ways, maybe explain it to someone else, look at it in different angles. And by doing that, you're going to be reinforcing it, moving it into their long term memory and teaching them how to retrieve it. And what you really want is for them to get it in their long term memory so that like the child with the tiger, she now has the word tiger. A single item in her working memory can represent something more complex. So break it into chunks. Give enough time for each chunk to actually settle before moving on. And beware distractions. So 
This is my cat, Louis. He's very nice. I completely derailed my last training day by showing a picture of him. I hope it won't happen. Um, I've now derailed this. So there are a number of people who are now looking around for where their cat is and are no longer listening. And there may also be people who had half nodded off who are now kind of paying attention again because they saw a cat, of course. But any distraction away from the topic you're trying to give is going to get their um, working memory full of loads of other stuff. It's just going to make it harder for them to concentrate and focus and keep on the topic. So they're called seductive details when you have fun bits of decoration that can actually be quite hard, especially for younger children, to work out where you want the attention to be. So this is my wonderful slide. Of course, there are things you want to decorate and you want to use colour and decoration for other reasons of making it attractive, engaging, getting attention. But just do it mindfully, because the more complex you make something, the more you're going to distract people. And sometimes they just don't know where to look and they don't know which part of it you want them to be focusing on. So another thing you could do is use familiar language. Now, I am aware that I am giving this talk in English, which means that for anyone where English is not their first language, it's going to be more difficult for them to follow because part of their working memory will be interpreting the words that I'm saying. So this is true for anyone you speak to. There'll be familiar and unfamiliar words. And many people don't read a lot and they don't engage with academic things. And the language we use when we talk in every day is very different from written language. So if we stick to chatty, talky language, we do make it easier for people to follow what we're saying. It's less effort. So things like saying, ah, oh, this is an annual occurrence. Words like this, they're called tier two words. They're not jargon as such but there are a lot of people who will stumble over them and it's a barrier to learning. You're making it more difficult than it needs to be. Also using words in ambiguous ways. So I've seen some astronomers say this to people, oh, that bright star is Jupiter. And they're using the word star to mean bright dot in the sky, but does the person know that? If they've just learned Jupiter is a planet and now they're told that star is Jupiter, how confusing is that? And it's also like the Milky Way, it can mean two different things and it, just to have clarity of what you're saying and which, how you're using words. And then the other thing with language is to use familiar patterns of language. So if you think of um, traditional fairy tales, they use rhythms and patterns of language which help tell the story and people are familiar with them and understand when narratives are given in that way. So for instance, this is quite a complicated thing to say, but the repetition and rhythm really helps to say the moon orbits the earth, the earth orbits the sun and the sun orbits the galaxy. And the repetition of the structure is making it easier for them to comprehend. And if you use similar structures and phrasing throughout a activity, that can really help because you're just reducing the cognitive load required to follow what you're saying. And the other thing, because we do have planetaria, which are amazing visualization machines, is to visualize informational relationships between things. So often when you give people ideas and concepts, they connect them in their minds. Everything is connected to everything else. But if they don't have an idea of an organizational structure, it can be quite hard for people to know where to put new ideas. And if you can give them a visualization within which they can then put these ideas, it makes it easier for them to link things in an organized structure, which will help them with future learning. So this isn't the best diagram in the world, but it's just to illustrate my point. Um, some people say that this is like having an extension of your working memory, that you're holding information visually um, on the page or on the screen. And in this way, you're relieving load in your um, working memory by extending it in this way. 
And finally, I have identified key points, because like I said before, people can't always, especially if they're beginners, it's hard for them to recognize sometimes what are the most important points, what are the main headings of what you said. So I will do that. My key points for reducing cognitive load are to chunk information, beware distractions, or you, you can use them, but just use them mindfully. Use familiar language, visualize relationships, and identify your key points. Don't worry about saying things, um, making things really explicit because that will really help people who are unfamiliar with the information. And to then sum up my whole talk, um, the three things I would like you to take away from all of this are firstly, that prior knowledge really matters because it will affect what's in their working memory and it will affect how they're um, putting new things into their mind how many links they have and how they're incorporating that. So this is a terrible talk because I'm not talking to you. It's not interactive. I don't know what your prior knowledge is. Try to find out what the prior knowledge is of your audience. Working memory is limited. It is the bottleneck. Do not put too much in there at one time. And long-term memory is the residue of thought. So this is something I would have liked to spend more time on. But as I said, when you think about something, the more you think about it, the more you practice retrieving it, the more you're going to remember it. And the memory is the residue of thought is a nice quote from Professor Daniel Willingham. And I've got some links that I will share in a little while. I'll paste them into the chat box. Um, and it's just a list of some of the top references that I'd recommend you have a look at if you want to know a bit more about all of this, because this was obviously just a really quick overview, just to show you what's there and give you some ideas for things to look into. But I think that is it from me. So I'll stop sharing and I'll, I don't know if I'm handing back to Shannon. All right. Great. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right, so I think we're gonna go ahead and move on to our workshop. Um, um, I think maybe if there's questions, we can pop them into the chat. Is that okay, Jenny? Okay, Jenny says yes. I'm gonna close the door again. All right, so I'm gonna um, turn it over to Dr. Sarah Schultz, who is going to lead us in a, um, in a workshop and Jenny, there's definitely been a lot of chatter if you wanna go back and kind of respond to some of the things in there too. Um, but Sarah, would you like to take it over? Certainly, I'm gonna just try to share my screen here. Can you hear me okay? Everybody hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, let's see here. Make sure I get the right window. Okay. Can I also check nope. and you can hear Oops. me as well? Oh, stop it. What am I doing? Yes, Eric, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm just getting my window screwed up here. Okay, can you see our slides? Yeah. Yes. I can see it. Perfect. Okay. Go ahead, Eric. Go ahead and get started. All right. So, hello, everybody, to the uh, workshop. My name is Eric Hernandez. I'm an undergraduate student in physics education at Minnesota State University, Moorhead. With me is Dr. Sarah Schultz, uh, the director of the MSUM Planetarium and my research advisor. So good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this workshop, we're going to talk about three specific things. We're going to talk about the assessment conversation as a form of formative assessment, uh, the purpose of questions in the planetarium and how to improve your questioning skills. So Sarah, you can start. All right, so we're going to start off by talking about formative assessment. And if you could just raise your hands or a thumbs up in the chat, or I mean in your window, um, if you have heard of formative assessment before. So we're looking at this uh, long term recall memory that Jenny was talking about. Okay, so I see some of you have wonderful. Um, so for those of you who are not aware of what formative assessment is, it's essentially a way of um, finding out what your audience knows as you're teaching them. So that's the formative assessment side of things there. It's as they're forming their um, understanding. 
So this happens during our, our presentation. So rather than giving quizzes at the end or something, you're, you're finding out what they're understanding as you go. Um, and so one type of formative assessment that we're going to specifically be looking at today is the assessment conversation. And so it sounds like a big word, but it's really just talking about um, talking, really. So let's take a look. Um, so assessment conversations are one type of formative assessment that involves questions and responses. So a dialogue when you're interacting with your audiences. Um, we're going to be looking specifically at what we call the ESRU cycle. Um, and this basically breaks up an assessment conversation into sections. And so as we always do, if we're starting a dialogue with someone, we ask a question or we make a statement. So that's our first part, the eliciting um, part, where we elicit a response from our audiences. Ask a question, ask them what they're seeing or whatever. Um, importantly, our audience has to respond. They have to give us some sort of a reaction to the question that we're asking them. We have to recognize those answers in some way, like, oh yes, okay, I hear someone saying this, that, whatever. And then the important part here that we're gonna be focusing the most on today is the using. And so actually taking those responses you're getting from your audience and using them to guide your instruction or to guide your presentation. So this way our audience can actually influence the way that our presentation goes. It's not just us, we become more of a guide or a facilitator and we can help our audiences learn more by understanding their previous knowledge and that kind of stuff that Jenny was talking about. So for this workshop, we're gonna be focusing on our eliciting questions and our using questions. And I want to also apologize that we're gonna go quickly here because we really wanna to get to the activity. So hopefully you can hang with us here. So Eric, take it away. Yeah. So for the uh, elicit stage, uh, you want to invite the student to give you more information about their thinking and understanding. So it can be the first step in a single ESRU cycle, or it can be a bridging step between cycles. It helps to think of this as the beginning of a conversation, not just like a question that you that you start with like an interview or something like this. Uh, you're inviting the student into the dialogue that you're having. Um, some quick strategies for the elicit stage. You, uh, priming your audience to interact at the beginning with simple questions. So if you notice, we asked a very simple question right away at the presentation if you've heard of formative assessment before. Um, also asking questions that are open-ended, uh, knowing common misconceptions. And uh, of these three, we're going to focus on open-ended questionings for today. So, so Eric, I wanted to pop in real quick and just say that when we're talking about open-ended questions, they are questions that you cannot answer just a simple yes, no, or some sort of a short answer like, what color is my shirt or whatever. You want something that, in, that requires a longer explanation so that you're not just cutting off the, the conversation. Um, and fortunately, Jenny has been talking about these misconceptions in her um, articles. So we can pay, you can look at that in the um, planetarium. All right, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, so open-ended questions encourage, like uh, Dr. Schultz said, encourage the student to share more of their understanding than they would otherwise. It shows the reasoning behind answers, uh, but open-ended questions by themselves aren't uh, as effective as, as, just because they're open-ended questions doesn't mean that they're really effective. The ones that are slightly beyond the comfort zone of your students are worth more than those that can be easily answered. So there's a spectrum of open-endedness. Uh, challenging your students makes them reveal more about how they actually think. So we're gonna have a quick activity before we head to the actual activity, um, the following. So here we have a question that is close-ended. So what are the possible responses to this question? You can go and ahead I'll, and put those in the chat. Yes, and I'll give like a, like a few seconds for this. Oh, we have, we have a good, we have a good, um, bridging off points. Oh, wow. This is awesome. Right. So because we have lots of smart people here, we're having lots of like uh, qualifiers where like, is it always blue? But so 
but in an actual planetarium, you would probably get yeses and and sometimes, right? Uh, for the whole, like the whole audience would say yes or or sometimes like that. So what are some ideas on how to make it open-ended? So if you can rephrase the question, type it in the chat as making it an open-ended question. And there is some clues already in the chat. Ah, yes. So if, yeah, so we saw some of them. So just the for the first question, the answer was already in the question. For the second question, you can actually take the answer out. And from there, you can actually diverge your responses. So what color is the sky? And then somebody can ask, well, uh, it's blue. And then you can say, well, is it always blue? And from there, you can have a kind of a bridging off point. So when you think of your questions, it helps to think of the purpose of the question, the possible responses, the structure, which is uh, the open endedness or the closed endedness. And uh, if the answer that you want is in the question, if you're just actually just feeding the student an answer, uh, a good open ended question can lead to related top topics that you can follow up on. So it gives opportunities to broaden the lesson. So Dr. Schultz is going to talk about the using part. All right. So using is is very important. We only, we have, only have about one minute left. One minute. Okay, we got to go fast. This is the important part. So pay attention. <laughs> um, so it's taking these answers that you're getting from your audience and going deeper, getting deeper into, okay, so why are you saying that it's gray if you're answering the um, sky is gray sometimes? Um, where is this coming from? So this part can be really difficult at first because it can be hard to think on your feet um, and use them, use the answers quickly or right away as you're teaching. Um, you can also be have to be careful to not get too sidetracked. You can go off on tangents um, and it can feel like you're using a lot of time um, and it can feel like it's taking too much time in your presentation. And so, so Eric, yes. go ahead, Eric. Uh, yeah. So in my own experience, it, uh, by taking the time to follow through, I think it's worth it. Um, I, I had like a whole spiel to say, but if we don't have enough time, I'll, I'll save it for the larger <laughs> workshop. In, in his experience, it really has helped. Yes. So um, all right, so some using strategies. A really easy one to start off with when you're just getting used to using is why or how. So why do you think this? How does that work? How do you, you know, so getting deeper into their understanding as opposed to just the answer that they've given you. Because sometimes they can give you the answer with the wrong understanding behind it. Um, and so you can deepen that conversation be beyond just simple retentive knowledge. You can also compare and contrast. So you can say, okay, Sally said this, and John said that. Who agrees with Sally? Raise your hand or whatever. Who agrees with John? Raise your hand or whatever. Why? Why do you agree with them? Why do you think they're correct? And so you're digging into some of their understandings and being able to compare and contrast and have them thinking critically about what it is that they're, under they're learning. Um, you can also connect back to prior concepts. So remember when we were talking about the sun and how it shines, um, you can always tie back to things that you've talked about earlier. So that can help kind of solidify um, the foundation of their understanding. So now we're actually going to have you try this. I know this is a super brief introduction, but hopefully some of you have kind of some previous experience with some of these things, but this will be a good practice for you. So Eric, go ahead. We're going to explain the activity for us. Yes. So I'll go a quick overview for the activity. Um, we'll divide everybody into five groups. Uh, the purpose of the activity is to work on open-ended questions and using questions. Uh, for the first group, uh, we'll, you'll have to come up with an open-ended question of your own. Uh, the second round, uh, you'll answer an open-ended question as if you were a third grade student or roughly 10 years old. Uh, for the third round, you'll uh, discuss these res uh, the responses to your question. For the fourth round, you will answer the using of another group. So you'll also come up with another uh, using in, your, in the third round. And the fifth round, uh, you'll discuss the answers to the using. And after the rounds, we'll meet up in the main room and discuss as a large group. So, so your, each group will have a moderator? 
Um, and so your moderator will help you also navigating through um, this activity. So if we want to go ahead, um, I think I'll stop sharing right now um, and get us, Michael, if you'd put us into our breakout rooms. Yes, just so everybody knows, there are five breakout rooms. They are named for your moderator. Moderators, you are already assigned to your rooms and everybody will be moved to those rooms uh, automatically. So uh, that should work. And Sarah, I have our, our timer ready to go. So we'll begin right about now. Here we go. Perfect. did I do? Uh oh, there we go. Okay, and just to kind of ask, we have a few minutes for a discussion, or do we should we just head to the conclusion? Now? Oh, we have we have time, Eric. You we have time. time. Yeah. So, yeah. what time are we supposed to wrap up? Uh, mm, let me check. Uh, we're supposed to be done at sixteen hundred, so you guys have nineteen minutes. Ooh, nineteen nice. minutes. Oh, okay. Although Shannon still needs to finish up with the overall discussion as well, so. Um, You've got 26 minutes. Ah, okay. Call it that. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Let's see where this, this one. No, this one. Okay. All right. Is everybody back then? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. All right. So way to go, everybody. Um, thank you for participating in our activity. Hopefully you got some interesting conversations out of it. And um, now we'd just like to open it up to discussion. And um, Eric, you're going to kind of guide us in this discussion here. Yeah. So uh, we have a few uh, moments. So we, what we'd like to do is we'd ask, like to ask each group to kind of talk about what their uh, kind of experience was, uh, if they have any like interesting things to note. So for, uh, we can just start. So for group one, the moderator, did you notice uh, anything interesting kind of happen in your group? Anything of note? Um, I guess that what I'd um, point to that we noticed was that, um, you know, we worked hard well, we worked on crafting, and we worked hard on crafting our using question. We came up with lots of options and we were discussing different, you know, oh, we could use this idea or this idea uh, from the different options that we were given. But our question was not interpreted the way that we intended. And that was our, you know, we did not word it um, as clearly as it could have been. Um, there was a lot of ways that it could be interpreted differently depending on your context. So you get different answers depending on where you are. And so that was really, you know, an interesting point of observation at the end to see the responses and go, well, you know, and we could have worked with it if we were in the dome with the kids and could have adjusted on the fly. But, um, you know, it made sense to us, but it was interpreted differently by our learners. <laughs> Sure. And that, that's a tough thing to do when you're just writing it out, especially. Um, as, certainly in, in the dome, it would be a very different situation because they would maybe answer your question and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa that's not what I asked you. I'm like, okay, now this is what I'm asking you. And then you rephrase. That's another really good yeah. way to um, use answers is rephrasing things, um, either repeating back what they're saying so that you're making sure that you're understanding um, what it is that they're saying to you but also rephrasing it so that you're guiding them to the, the question that you're actually asking. Great. Thanks, Julia. Yeah. yeah. And Sarah, do you think it'd be possible to actually show their, their jam boards while we do this? Um, guess, or would you still like to have the uh, information here? I, you know what I will share here. Um, so go ahead and have group two 
visit. I will put a link to the Jamboard in the chat. Okay, okay. And then people can go and take a look at them. Yes, make sure it's like a, a commenter or viewer link. Yeah, yep. Okay. And then for group two, uh, the question that I have is, what was your immediate reaction to like the sets of questions that you got? So group two. Uh, the moderator for group two should be Sh Shannon. Okay, yeah. Um, so I, I think our reaction was um, more along the lines of, all right, so how do we maybe follow up with the questions? Um, and how do we maybe uh, bring in different visualizations to try to help think about that a little bit more? Um, so I, I would say that's sort of the initial reaction was along the lines of, uh, how do we how do we now follow up more <laughs> or how do we ask another using question yeah in like in a, in a planetarium setting though getting those answers and then having some time to think about it is probably not always feasible so it helps to have a some sort of practice of like so here's like in the, in a in a workshop setting where you have some time you have 5 minutes or 3 minutes we gave you uh, to come up with a using question. And not only did you come up with just one, but you got, came up with a list and you could choose in between. But in a planetarium setting, that might actually be, you know, that's not actually possible. Um, so if you saw those answers in a planetarium setting, how would you feel? What, what What's your like immediate reaction? And not only you can answer, but also some mm -hmm. people in the um, group if they if they want to say anything. So if you saw those answers in a planetarium mm -hmm. setting, what was your, what would be your immediate reaction? Would anyone else like to to say anything from our group? I mean, I think I think it would kind of go back to kind of the our our gut reaction of like what, um, what can we go pull out from our stash of props that are in the back that might help with this or that we already have out for for a show to um, to then ask a new a new question. It, um, it always helps to have something in the back as like backup. Mm -hmm. um, so for group four. Um, that should be Mark Percy. So of these Wait. two <clears throat> sets of answers, sorry. I, I thought it was group three. Oh, did I say group four? I meant group three. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was just a Freudian slip. But for group three, Mark Percy, uh, of those two sets of answers, which one made you feel like you knew the person who answered more? Boy, that's that's a good question. Yeah. I, I mean, my takeaway from it was that w once we got in the middle of discussing things, we we let me repeat it to you: two one two, two three zero. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Once once we got in, it, we realized that there were a lot of a lot of perspectives on on the questions about seasons people in different hemispheres people at different latitudes having more or less seasonal change um we talked a lot about shadows and we realized that um you know we we needed to be more specific about the way we were asking the question um you know specifying are we talking about the length of shadow at noon versus or do we mean throughout the day from sunrise to noon to sunset? Um, in terms of knowing our answer better, <laughs> it's hard to say. I don't know. Anybody yeah. else in the group feel well, like they? Uh, well, yeah, while you think of that answer, actually, I want to like kind of note something you said. So when you got those answers, it made you think about the question that you asked. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. We, so that's. Yes, that's actually really important because you get not only do you give feedback to your students um, by kind of like using an answer from them, but the answers that you get kind of tells you a lot about the question that you asked. So if you feel like maybe I wasn't too specific or maybe I was too broad, that 
act from those answers, you can actually get that information for yourself. And that's also a very important part of formative assessment because you also get feedback for yourself on how to teach or how oh, to do the show. Yeah, very much so on questioning. Like we couldn't just say, when is the sun highest and lowest? You know, you had to say, again, are you talking time, certain time of day? Are you talking a certain season? But then even beyond that, you know, where are you on the earth when, when you're trying to answer this question? Yeah. And I will say that sort of ambiguity, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because that sort of ambiguity of like, maybe I should be more specific. Maybe there's too many things kind of that are unsaid. But that sort of ambiguity can also be an opportunity to have the topic broaden up but at the same time it's kind of a hard thing because you also have to make sure that the topic doesn't just veer off into a, a million different branches that you can't pull back into uh, so that ambiguity kind of being sure and confident co confidence of the many different things that it answers that could be uh, out there everything that your audience is thinking of uh, it helps to kind of try and practice being secure in that sort of un uncertainty um, because once you're sh sure of that uncertainty which is kind of like a paradox but um, it kind of it makes you feel um, it gives you more masterful control of the kind of flow of the assessment conversation and the show the planetarium show of your own um but thank you thank you mark percy um for group four uh, the question that I have, uh, which questions eliciting or using took more time to come up with? So that's more of an easy question question to ask, answer. I think that we spent more time on the using question. And then even after we uh, came up with it, we thought about ways to make it better, to get more information, to really help with the conversation and not have it just end with a yes or no. Um, because what we have here is if there's a 1% chance that you would not make it back from Mars because we wanted to do seasons on Mars, I guess, I don't know, um, <laughs> would you go? Uh, but the addition that I think we would do to that would be um, what odds would you need to have to see, um, to actually make the decision to go? Um, so to not just have it end there with like a yes or a no. Um, yeah, and it's always hard uh, to come up with a, because an open-ended question is hard to come up with. And sometimes a question that seems open-ended isn't actually open-ended. And sometimes it takes actually asking it to know that. Um, because I don't know if anybody else has this, but sometimes you hear something and it sounds good in your brain and then you say it and then it's not the best thing. Sometimes it's like that with open-ended questions. Um, uh, but yeah, so the using did take more time and that's usually the case. And that's because you're getting answers. Uh, you're taking all the answers, you're kind of processing it in your brain and trying to come up with enough, a question that not only uses them well, uh, but is open-ended. So the open-ended questions by themselves, you can kind of plan them out during a show. You can say, okay, so we're going to talk about this. I'm going to ask, there's some common misconceptions about this. I'm going to ask a question about, uh, if we're talking about the seasons, I can ask a question about, oh, is are the seasons caused by the distance from the sun to the earth? And that's a question that you can ask and you can plan for it. But sometimes the audience gives you answers that you did not think of at all. And it's kind of hard to come up with a using on the spot. Um, so some of it is just actually taking some time a little bit to kind of just process the answers that you're getting and try to come up with a using that's, you know, effective, uh, and not just, you know, just saying something that's right off the, right off your mind. Um, for group five, uh, the question that I'll ask you, um, I'll, I'll say a question that I got, uh, that I asked somebody else, another group, but. Uh, what would you have done if you had gotten these answers in an actual planetarium setting? So the two sets of answers. Okay, so um, if I would have gotten any of these in a planetarium program presentation, it would have been, um, my first thing would be to, which one of these do I try to address first? Because they were very diverse and they showed uh, 
difference of misconceptions or ideas. And I would have scrambled to go get the trip and Z to try to help them visualize something. But um, as Alan has pointed out in the chat, seasons is probably one of the most difficult concepts to understand and even college graduates have a hard time with it. So I would have tried to find out what was their lowest level of understanding and build on to that because sometimes I think we want to get to the, the end point when we've left gaps in between. So anybody else from my group want to chime in? When it comes to seasons, uh, chunking becomes very, very important. Uh, you know, what, uh, um, what was pointed out in the first talk, um, that you deal with little bite-sized concepts. Because when you're dealing with seasons, it's, uh, you know, there's, <clears throat> there is the distance to the earth misconception as a cause, but there's also um, the, uh, <clears throat> well, the length of daylight, the amount of daylight is one factor. And then also the angle of sunlight is also another factor, the angle that sunlight is striking the ground. So these, each of these things is actually challenging to teach about. And they're all, they all pool in together to explain why there are seasons. Yeah, it's always like a bunch of complicated things, always with like something that seems simple, always have like five different reasons for it. Um, but thank you, Alan. Uh, and thank you everybody, for uh, all the moderators for helping us with the activity. Uh, we'll go on to the conclusion now. So just one more time, thank you all for doing the activity with us. Uh, you all had re really good conversations. I was kind of jumping through the groups and listening in on you. Uh, but just to conclude, um, just to reiterate the points, the assessment conversation is a versatile form of formative assessment. Um, so using the ESRU cycle as a model of your assessment conversation is also pretty useful because it kind of, uh, as we said earlier, it chunks the assessment conversation itself. Open-ended questions, um, not just open-ended questions, but actually effective open-ended questions, making sure that you know something about your students beforehand uh, by prompting or priming uh, questions so that you can effectively open it, uh, ask them open-ended questions. And then uh, using, so using, uh, processing what your students are saying, uh, as another, uh, as a, another person said, picking out which answer to focus on, and fo focusing on that for the lesson and using that answer um, is also really good for the for the planetarium show. But thank you, everybody. So uh, for the workshop. This was our, our first workshop with this, so it might have been a little rough in some places, but uh, thank you for bearing with us, and we hope to see you at another workshop of ours. Uh, Dr. Sarah Schultz, anything else? Um, I think we'll hand it back over to Shannon to wrap up for the Education Committee. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, um, Sarah and Eric and Jenny and everybody for um, helping out with this session and doing some really amazing work. I, I know that the, the workshop um, was something that um, probably would have been a bit longer in a normal session, but uh, so I think uh, this is a really fantastic opportunity, though, for everyone to learn about your work and um, practice that. And it seems to have also uh, built off very nicely off of Jenny's talk. So I do want to thank you. Uh, thank thank everybody for, for presenting here, first of all. Um, and I would also uh, just want to wrap up that, again, if you are interested in joining the Education Committee, um, you can either shoot me an email, um, which I will put into the chat. Um, 
Um, we also have a quick survey that I've also just put into the chat that we would love to hear from, from you all as well. If you have any ideas or projects um, that you might be interested in seeing the Education Committee uh, pursue. Um, and then also there's an opportunity to say there whether or not you'd like to join. You can also mention on that if you would uh, like to join uh, Mark Percy on the uh, under the class dome column at all or anything along those lines. So again, we'd love to have everyone join us. So, all right, I'm going to end it there. One minute early. Thank you so much for, to Shannon and the team. Um, that puts us exactly on schedule. The next 30 minutes is a, a break uh, and time for some networking. Um, Shannon and Sarah and Jenny, if, uh, if you guys are uh, around for the next 30 minutes, feel free to reach out to them and discuss. Uh, but this is uh, open time, uh, free microphones for everybody. And we will, of course, be. Thank you. So as it's stated on the IPS website, uh, and it has been expanded since uh, the membership committee split off and became a, a, a larger formal committee in 2019. Uh, yes, of course, the, the things you would think of uh, as an obvious function of a membership committee to uh, admit candidates, to, to uh, collect fees, to work with the treasurer, of course. But we also wanted to make sure that we, we took a stronger more thorough role in membership development. And one of the things that we really wanted to see done was some kind of a major membership campaign. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. We wanted to improve the, the forms of communication. We wanted to expand and improve on the, the messaging of what IPS is, the kind of services that it has. And so those are the things that have been added uh, since the, the uh, committee became a little bit more formal, I guess you could say. This is what the uh, membership of the campaign looks like, what the, uh, the and it has been uh, changing and evolving somewhat. Um, Amy just joined us as a new member. We're gonna be getting her oriented. And uh, as the new um, IPS director of operations is, is coming online, uh, we will be um, getting Ijona. I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. And Iona. so, sorry. Iona. Iona, thank you very much. I hate it when I mispronounce people's names. And so we'll, uh, we'll definitely want to make sure we're getting uh, people up to speed. Um, uh, Mike's mail, since you spoke up uh, and you are now... Uh, actively jumping into the treasurer's position, we're definitely gonna be getting you uh, a lot more integrated. Uh, so I, uh, if you don't mind, we actually consider you to be a member of the committee as well. Sorry, I didn't put your name on there, but I didn't want you to think I was suddenly volunteering you either. <laughs> so again, for most of IPS's history, the membership function was folded into the treasurer's position, and there might have been one or two helpers, I think, over, over time, especially with the, the compilation of the membership lists and things like that. But we wanted to, uh, when, when uh, in 2019, I worked a lot with Mark Subarau to, uh, and the council in order to facilitate a change that would allow us to expand our function and our uh, capabilities and our hopefully our effectiveness at being able to, to bring people uh, try to develop, uh, say, a 21st century view of what IPS is becoming and how it can uh, really incorporate a lot more services. Because a lot of those services have been available, but many people just weren't uh, aware of them. So what are, the, what are the kind of projects that we have been embarking on since we opened? I already mentioned the, the idea of trying to put together uh, a, a major membership development um, drive. And that has taken a lot of research and there are still a lot of things that need to be put into place before we're really ready to embark on something. We had hoped to actually start something in 2020 and you all know what happened in 2020. It, we saw a perfect opportunity as we were getting close to the 2020 IPS conference, which of course also ended up going online. But 
it's still it's still ongoing because that's that's going to take a lot more uh, preparation, and we'll tell you what, what some of those uh, items are here in a minute. A lot of these things that are going to follow are the elements we want to have better in place. How are we communicating with the membership, and what can we do to help improve that? And I should also mention that a lot of these things will be working on in conjunction with the officers, with the board, with the affiliates. Uh, we want this to be uh, a very inclusive process. A part of what we also want to have in place before the campaign is what else can we do to be communicating with members, uh, not just new members, but renewing members uh, and with existing members. What, what are we doing to help communicate to make sure that everyone is aware of the services that are available or just to be able to, to collaborate. And so COVID of course changed a lot of this, but uh, we are uh, developing uh, some pieces, things that can go automatically, for instance, when new members join, a follow-up communication and maybe a month after they join, what are the things that we can do? And like I mentioned already, uh, getting uh, IPS board members, the regional affiliate representatives, uh, working in collaboration, because in order to reach all of the people, uh, especially as we try to update mailing lists or update our, our methods of contacting people, we're going to need help from all of the regions. And so it's not something that uh, any one or two people or even the entire membership committee can do alone. That's a big project. One of the things that we found is really making people more aware of the benefits that are available to them. Uh, there, there's more to IPS than just a regional magazine and a biannual conference. And we'll get into that here in just a second. One of those things is we created uh, during Mark's tenure was the Planetarian Network, which is uh, a dedicated online network uh, more than Domel, because it's a place where we can share resources, where we can share specific topics, where specific regions can even start their own uh, uh, discussions if they need to. And it's growing, but it still needs a lot more activity. It needs a lot uh, more support and uh, uh, active communication, but it's getting there. One of the biggest things, and this is where we've we've had to spend an, uh, an inordinate amount of time on, is how to update the IPS directory and the membership database so that uh, we have uh, a database available for membership development, but making sure that the emails and content that's in there is legal because of all the new communication rules, especially by email and electronically, and being able to keep uh, keep that under um, uh, the legal guidelines, especially in Europe. When it comes to the campaign, probably the first thing that we developed was a short list of why join IPS. This was this is a communication piece that could be used whether we're talking with somebody at a conference, whether we're emailing back and forth with someone whether we're talking on the phone, when we're, whether we're, uh, uh, someone uh, approaches us or wants to follow up about a, an email that we sent out asking them to join. Because again, this is probably, uh, ever since I joined IPS in the 80s, this is, this is the question I get more often than any other. That uh, yeah, the quarterly magazine is great. Uh, the biannual conference is nice, except that there's a lot of people who can't attend them. So what else is there? Well, I think a lot of us who are active in IPS know that there are a lot of answers. There's a, there are a lot of available resources. Uh, and of course, there's the, the benefits of simple of putting in some effort. If a, with a little bit of communication, there can be collaboration. You can, you can learn about innovative projects. Uh, so a, a lot of it is, is sure it's fellowship based and 
we want to make sure that there are forums available that or people know where to go to expand on and work on those um, connections, those relationships, because a lot of that, that's a lot of what it really comes down to. We're trying to get IPS to evolve from a, oh, we're just going to provide content and services and stuff as the benefits. And more as the benefit is joining an organization that you get to communicate with your colleagues, that you get to learn new techniques, uh, that you get to make connections. Because it, it, that's really one of the benefits of a professional organization. It's not, it's not, oh, okay, well, what free shows are you going to give me? It's how involved you get is how much you get back. And that's where IPS is evolving. And that's the message we're trying to send. But we also want to make it easier so people know where to go if they have certain questions. And, and so we, we want to create more of a, of a one-stop shop kind of situation. That's why the Planetarian Network is there. That's why there's been so much work uh, on the IPS website. Um, uh, thanks to Alan and, and others. So there are, there are many elements, many benefits that we are trying to work in. We want to make sure that we find a vehicle for communication. So what, what's going on right now? What are, what are some of our goals for the next year? Well, we're looking to try to finalize what our email communication method is going to be. I think we're uh, it, it was getting really complicated to try to figure out how we could build the, the IPS directory without having to individually contact every person. And that just wasn't feasible. So um, we're working on it. But these many of these are items that we need before we can launch a campaign. But we really want to get feedback. And that means any of you, and if anyone is interested in joining uh, the the membership committee, uh, you're certainly welcome to contact us. We have a lot of things, a lot of projects, especially related to the campaign that are gonna uh, make it really busy. We're not gonna be able to just have one or two or three mover shakers. It's gonna take a team. We are uh, revising the letters that go out so that when a new member comes on, they get something more than just an email of welcome and here's the website. <laughs> we wanna make sure that they get uh, a robust welcome letter that outlines exactly what the benefits are, where they can go for information. And also something that's custom, that's somewhat customized for renewing members and for, of course, prospective members. And then what kind of follow-up communication are we going to send people? One of the most effective things we found that a lot of other uh, organizations use is a follow-up, maybe in a, a couple of weeks or a month that says, hi, just wanted to, again, welcome you. Do you have questions that now that you've uh, seen where the resources are, what can we help you with? Or maybe even having an individual in their region contact them directly say, what else can I help you with as far as IPS is concerned? What do you need? What kind of questions do you need answered? What do you need help with? So uh, this is, is very related, of course. It's uh, when people want to join, what is the key message? Why should they join and why should they join now? That would be especially important when we have uh, a campaign to do. Uh, one of the things I've learned by doing uh, membership campaigns in other organizations is it's, it's not enough just to have a nice long list of, of benefits and join now. Usually what gets people to act and act quickly is if you have some urgent message as to why they should join right now. What's going on right now? Is it a conference that's coming up that you don't want to miss? or even if it's an e-conference, is it a resource that's just recently been made available to members only that you can get right now if you join? I mean, there are all kinds of possibilities, but uh, there needs to be some kind of an urgent uh, uh, reason 
for people to join. So we're looking at what those might be. Yes, we needed to wait until after the pandemic, but it turned out there was a lot of these, a lot of these resources and, and messaging and the services that we use to communicate and train and orient people. Maybe there's some orientation videos that we send out to all the affiliates, for example, that they can use that maybe it's an officer or someone in the committee that actually walks people through in a video what IPS and what it has, where here's where you can find things. Um, because an email with links is not extremely personable. You know, we want to make that connection. And uh, again, I've mentioned this, of course, a couple times already, but uh, we want this to become a, a very collaborative process where uh, the board and the affiliates are involved, especially when there, are let's say there are new members that are within one particular region, or we're trying to reach out to update uh, what's going on in planetariums, where, what all, if there's anything new that's taken place, a new renovation or a new facility, we want to have the, a vehicle <clears throat> for knowing about them. And if each region has a representative that is much more likely to hear about any upgrades or changes, staff changes, facility changes, that they can let uh, the membership committee know and we can reach out to them. You know, hey, I heard you're the new planetar planetarium director at XYZ Planetarium. Uh, IPS is here. And if you're, if you're not a member, uh, talk to us or we can reach out to you or, or what have you. I think we're going to need to be a lot more proactive if we want to develop uh, the membership of IPS in the 21st century. And that takes time, that takes work, and it takes a crew. And that's why we're really excited to have uh, a good bunch of active people in the membership committee, but we can always use more, especially as we get to some of these big projects. Uh, we mentioned maybe even be creating a presentation it doesn't necessarily have to be a video. Maybe it would be a, a kind of a PowerPoint that people can take with them and give live or even give live online. But if, that way there's interaction and there's a way to communicate about what IPS is. And arming the affiliates and the board members with such a presentation, of course they can adapt it to however it works best for them, for their region, for their language, for their customs, traditions, but that way the message is much more customized. It doesn't come from a US-centric uh, uh, IPS membership idea. So for it to really be most effective, it needs to come from those local uh, representatives. And we want them to be excited and aware of what IPS and what is and what, what they have. And because it's gonna take that sincere enthusiasm and close knowledge of IPS to really help other people see it too. So that's really what's going on in a nutshell. I wanted to, to, to get through some of those. We've, uh, uh, I will admit that um, I, I've had a little bit of a struggle in, in recent months as we're trying to, we just got our planetarium reopened, but I am hoping to to get meetings started back up again with uh, the committee members. Uh, I think there's a lot of you out there. You've probably been wondering, well, what happened to Mike? <laughs> Here I am, I'm still alive. So uh, I wanted to go ahead and take a moment then and, and open it up for questions. Thank you. So if there's anything on those, those lists that you wanted to ask about, I know I didn't go into a lot of gory detail and I don't like reading text, but um, I wanted to give you at least an outline that, hey, the IPS membership committee uh, is relatively, still relatively new and we're still developing some big ideas. And we wanna make sure that we have a vehicle for connecting with people. That's really the message. Mike, remember the newsletter. 
Oh, yeah. I do need to give you some stuff for the newsletter. Hi, hey, Mike, it's Jim. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, maybe I missed it. Did you review the numbers? I'm just very curious about what the membership numbers are now, how they've been trending, and uh, if there are projections. So I have not seen the numbers recently. Um, Mike, have you seen where we're at with anything? I mean, the last time I noticed it was still, it was still relatively low. Like what was it below 500 members? No, we are currently uh, just, we're actually currently a little closer to 600. We're right around 585 members uh, right oh, now. Better. Uh, we have, we have seen, as you mentioned, Mike, we have seen a market uptick in people registering before this VCon. There was obviously interest and we had, you know, a, a new member, uh, Marina Well earlier who mentioned signing up just to be able to uh, uh, to attend this. So we, we do see some drives. Um, our membership is always very cyclical though. Uh, the, the heavy historical emphasis on the IPS conference means we always see higher membership in conference years than we do in non-conference years. Um, but it has been uh, it, it has been trending up uh, over the last uh, over the last year or two, which has been which has been uh, positive to see. And uh, uh, Dana sent me a message also about the membership brochure, and that is something that's going to be updated as well. We're looking at all the literature. So yes, there are going to be a lot of resources. I do very much encourage you all to take a look at um, the Planetarium Network, and uh, I can I'll post a, a link to it. Uh, it it just asks a single question so that we can screen. We were all it, it for the first few months anybody could join, and then of course the 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 auto scanners and, and spammers found us, and so <laughs> we just ask a simple question. So. The planetary network right now is free and open to everyone. At some point, it may become a an IPS benefit, but we wanted to make sure that we could start it in such a way that uh, we could gather as much as many members as possible. I think it's up to about 400 people in the network now. The nice thing about it is, is it's a place to uh, not just post announcements of 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 um, presentations, but it's a great place to post resources that others can grab and that's not something that's easily done with a with a um a, a listserv or domel hey mike it's martin Hi, great mike. to see you online um i thought i'd lend just a little bit of perspective from uh and this is ancient history for most of you now back in the early 2000s um when i was ips president we looked very closely at uh, just the the structure of the organization, um, because I realized quite early on that <clears throat> um, the membership was remaining around the five six hundred mark. Uh, it was almost like whatever we did, it remained at the five or six hundred mark. <laughs> and and when you look at it strategically, you realize that the the structure of the organization is actually designed that way. Um, we have a community of practice that is about five or six hundred people wide that will want to join IPS. And whatever you do, um, those kinds of numbers are not going to change significantly unless you change the structure of the organization from the ground up. Well, John Elvert and Thomas and everybody have done significant work on changing that structure. And so I think it would be interesting to look at that perspective um, from a strategic point of view and see what, what are the new dynamics. Uh, you mentioned about drivers to membership um, and one of the uh, people, I've forgotten who it was because I was off camera, but <laughs> uh, just now said uh, that there's been a little uptick in membership just recently so they could join this virtual conference. Um, there's your clue is um, an annual meeting instead of a biannual meeting, uh, even if one of them is virtual. I think uh, this virtual world is gonna be uh, with us a while uh, and also is extremely beneficial. So uh, just some yeah. of my thoughts is- I to appreciate look at it. 
That, no. That's a really excellent point about the uh, occasional virtual meetings. I think it would be great to continue some of the virtual meetings. In fact, uh, one of the things discussed in the committee as well were whether or not there were there were any kind of, of uh, guest speakers uh, that could be brought in virtually that IPS would bring in and host so that uh, it would have a much wider reach rather than say waiting every two years for to bring in a speaker at the biennial meeting. But what if we had something that was available every few months, either as a, a guest speaker from NASA or from the European Southern Observatory or what have you. So that's a great point. Thank you, Martin. And to that point, the officers have uh, had these conversations and we are fully intending on continuing these virtual conferences in the off years from the in-person conferences uh, to continue uh, maintaining the, this community for all of us, for the people, as you mentioned, uh, Mike, there's difficulties, not everybody can attend the conferences, uh, but we cast such a, such a wide net, we're able to, to reach so many new people with these virtual conferences. It's, uh, it's absolutely important and it's why we're absolutely going to continue them. Yeah. And that is great news. Thank you. If you want even more mics to listen to. Um, the, this year, of course, uh, you've all noticed is a little bit different and we wanted to try, you know, a proof of concept of what would a shorter virtual conference look like if it was specifically uh, focusing on IPS and the internal workings, you know, what's going on in the future, how we're preparing for uh, elections and conferences, and then looking at the committees themselves as a way to gain insight into parts of the organization that for some of you, you may not have had yet, or that you haven't had in a while. And, you know, the fact that we've been hovering right about, you know, 90 to 110, the, the last two days has been really great. And that we're getting to hear from, from parts of the organization that may not necessarily be as high profile as others and be able to keep something like this in place where we can, you know, we still have all of our opportunities for delegates and for the membership to actively engage everyone else in these sorts of settings, but also to turn the, the mirror on us occasionally and let you know what we're doing. And I think that helps with transparency and growth. And, and it's certainly, I mean, even for, for me as an officer, I've been gaining a lot of insight the last two days. And I think that's a, uh, that's a pretty good indication that, that, that this is working out uh, better than we intended, to be honest. And, and I really Michael, appreciate um, hearing the updates. In addition to uh, in these off-year virtual conferences, I think we're also committed to having all of the in-person conferences going forward being hybrid conferences. And that, so, you know, I, I think we had been limited by what's the size of the community that can afford to go to an international conference. And um, hopefully that will remove some of those barriers as well. Because, you know, while, you know, Martin mentioned like, you know, there's this, the community of practice only being so large. You know, there are 3,000 plus planetariums around the world. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of room for growth there. And I wanted to add that, uh, you know, for a while I was like, do we need a newsletter? You know, and uh, because of the planetarian network, you know, I think that's the that should be like the most active, etc., uh, place. And and I was told, well, you know, it's it's just like a, a means of condensing all the messages that IPS would be sending all over, you know, many times a month. So it is uh, also respectful of people's times to get, you know, like a friendly reminder of things. Uh, that is a good. It's so it's in a way a digest of the network, if you wish. Um, so just wanted to say that. Remember, newsletter, send news. Well, I, I know that we've got time for, for them tomorrow. You're going to hear from, from EDI, um, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, quite a bit. But I think it's also important to, um, you know, shine the light on the work that, that Dana and Danny and that team have done over the last couple of years to, to reset our perspectives and that all of this is based on ideas of accessibility and that accessibility matters and that any organization that can make itself more accessible to its membership is going to be more successful. And that's been, I think, I think a whole sea change for us the last couple of years. And, you know, it's seeing the, the closed captioning on people's PowerPoints 
it's seeing, you know, our, our peer to peer project with Russia, where we're going to have, you know, translation and, and facilitation on both sides of that just makes this, it, it makes it better for, you know, the, the English language speakers uh, of which IPS is, you know, an, an English language organization for the most part, but that we're looking to a future where that becomes less and less of a burden and barrier and more and more of a way for us to incorporate these parts of the, the, the world that are, you know, we saw it yesterday with APA and, and APS and APAS. We've, we've got huge parts of the world that are coming under our umbrella now that we need to lean in even further and, and help them to, to succeed. Anybody else? I'm just going to, I'm not volunteering at the moment. I hasten to add. <laughs> I just want that on record. I've experienced that before. Um, but if someone's wanting to come, become more involved, but not quite sure what aspect they want to do or worried that it will just be too much for them to do, what would you advise on who would you want, who would you suggest we speak to? Because I'm sure there's someone out there who'd be interested. So are, are you talking about a particular uh, service that would be uh, something the membership can offer or? I'm, I'm possibly, I'm just thinking this, I'm sure there's some people, I've, I've certainly found the past couple of two, two years, uh, two conferences quite inspiration, wanting to think, maybe possibly want to contribute more to the international community. Um, in a particular, person one should speak to or kind of to get an overview of what everything is and find your little kind of aspect of where you, your niche that you'd be able to contribute most and no I'm not going for President Jenny. Well uh, one of the things that we've been hoping to develop the planetarian network into is an opportunity for people to to throw out those kinds of questions uh, to even to make suggestions uh, to you can even create specific topics where people can contribute and collaborate. Um, but if, if nothing else, if it doesn't, and, and even what um, a little bit more of what is IPS will be getting posted in there. Uh, but if anyone has any questions, they can certainly start with me. They can, they're welcome to email and uh, start a conversation and I'm happy to brainstorm. That's really what we're there for. We wanna know how else can we serve? One of the ways that I got involved right from the beginning, uh, one of the reasons I got involved in uh, being active uh, was because I had a personal need. So I was a portable planetarium director. I was isolated from everyone. I was reinventing the wheel. And I needed to have a community of people that could uh, brainstorm together and make things easier for us. So that may be something you could think about. Um, what is it that is um, an issue in your job or your position right now? Um, and or what is, uh, what's your fort? What, what is it that you do really, really well and that you have a passion for because you don't want to get into volunteering um, somewhere where you're just, um, a body, you want to be the spirit, you want to be really involved. So it has to be something you're passionate about, or something that you really need a solution for. Um, and there are many of us who are past presidents who are still around. And we've had a lot of experience with all the different committees. Um, um, of course, committee chairs are the people to go, go and ask questions to. Um, those are some of my thoughts anyway. Thank you, Susan. In fact, I wanted to, um, I don't know, I went through the membership list or the, um, the committee uh, members rather quickly, but I don't know if you noticed, but a, a vast majority of them are past IPS presidents. And so there is a lot of institutional knowledge and historical knowledge 
and the kind of wisdom that Susan just shared, there's, there's a lot of that in there. And it's, it's great to have conversations about what, we, what else IPS can do uh, to make it valuable to its members. Another thing we'd like to see more representation uh, in the committee for is a more international uh, members on the committee. Um, uh, so if there are others that especially that are interested in how IPS can be of service to your particular region of the world, we would, we would really love to have that input and participation. Well, like I said, I'll post a link to the Planetary Network and uh, I encourage you to, to take a look at it. The more, we, the more we put content in there and ask questions, the more active and useful I think it'll become. But uh, it's also a, a way of getting in touch with, with all of us. But uh, thank you all very much for letting me present what's going on with IPS membership. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike, and to the to the the great feedback. It's of course like we're not an organization if we don't have a strong membership, uh, and so this of course is a, an incredibly important part of that. Um, we've got about five minutes until our next uh, and final session for today, which is from the Science Data Visualization Group. Um, but since uh, Dana had a slightly shorter uh, presentation time yesterday. Um, there was a bit of a mix up and she, uh, she deserves a little bit more time to showcase one of the episodes from the AAVSO Ball State IPS collaboration runs about three and a half minutes. Dana, you are a co-host. You can go in ahead and share that. And then uh, Mark will get started right afterward. I'm just making sure I'm sharing the sound and optimizing the video. Okay, this is one of the uh, variable star episodes that's available for free download. And I'll put the link in the chat after it's done. Hope you enjoy. In your night sky, there are many stars that you can connect to make a triangle. In the Northern hemisphere during the summer and the fall, you can see three especially bright stars in the shape of a large triangle. It's called the Summer Triangle. The stars that make it up are Deneb, Vega, and Altair. Each one of these stars is a part of its own constellation. Deneb is in Cygnus, the Swan, Vega is in Lyra, the Harp, and Altair is in Aquila, the Eagle. It can look pretty quiet up there, but there's a lot going on in this region of space. There are black holes like Cygnus X1, planetary nebulae like the Ring Nebula, and red giant stars like R. Aquilae. These are all examples of what can happen along a star's life cycle. As they age, stars that are similar to our sun will eventually become red giant stars like R. Aquilae here. They will then die and become planetary nebulae, like the Ring Nebula. Since our Aquilae is much older than our sun, it is running out of its hydrogen fuel. As a result, its temperature decreased, making it now shine red. It has also expanded, becoming much larger than it once was. When our sun goes through a similar process in about 5 billion years, it will expand so much that our home, Earth, will be orbiting just inside the sun's outer atmosphere. Our Aquilae is also a variable star since its brightness fluctuates over time. At its brightest, it is just visible to the naked eye as a dim red star. At its dimmest, it is barely visible in binoculars. The period from one dimming to the next is about 270 days. The changes in brightness we see are likely caused by thermal pulses in a shell of hydrogen gas generated by a deeper shell of helium gas building up inside the dying star. 
Eventually, these shells of gas will expand out into space, and our aquilae will become a planetary nebula similar to the Ring Nebula. Not all stars will end their lives this way. Stars many times more massive than our sun will turn into red supergiants before they go supernova. After that, they will then either turn into a dense neutron star or a black hole like Cygnus X1, one of the closest black holes to Earth. Still, it's about 6,000 light years away. That means if we had the technology that could travel the speed of light, it would take us about 6,000 years to get to it. To help you explore the constellations of the Summer Triangle and the rest of your night sky, try using a star chart or an app on your phone, or you can use our special handout. This Variable Star episode is brought to you by Ball State University, the International Planetarium Society, and the American Association of Variable Star Observers, an international consortium of amateur and professional astronomers. For more information on variable stars and how to observe them, visit their website at aabso.org. All right, thanks everyone. Awesome, thank you so much, Dana. Looks great, sounds great. Narrator is pretty on point there, so well done. Um, and that brings us to our final session of today, this is the Science and Data Visualization Task Force, chaired by our very own past president, Mark Subrow. Mark, take it away. Thank you, Michael. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking about uh, Colin's last question um, about how to get involved. And I was thinking, you know, this journey started out uh, when, I, when I, you know, looked up at the this, this structure of IPS at the time, I saw there was an education committee, but nothing related to science. Um, and I mentioned that to uh, Thomas Kraupe, who is the president. And pretty soon, um, I was chair of a, a new committee. And that committee led to other involvement. And next thing, I was president. So that, that's how it happens. And it can happen fast, right? So we're, we're a volunteer-driven organization. And if there's something you don't like, there's something you, you think should be done differently, um, people are happy to, to hand over the reins and let you do that. So. Don't feel like there are any barriers to getting involved. Um, we're always anxious for everybody's input. All right, let me quickly share. Right. So um, what we're going to do uh, now is a uh, sort of whirlwind uh, um, state of um, some of the things happening with uh, data visualization in the planetarium. Um, those are focused in two of the, the key, key areas um, that uh, this task force has pushed on. One is really sort of uh, taking advantage of the, the power of a, a modern digital planetarium to, to advance scientific research. Um, and we'll hear presentations from uh, Tom Jarrett uh, and Tom Kwasnitska. And uh, another uh, effort has been um, creating linkages to some of the major content producers, some of the major scientific organizations. And um, um, both Lars uh, and myself have, have semi-recently uh, switched jobs. So we're gonna uh, be reporting on uh, our, our new positions and our efforts uh, that we have going on there. Mark, would it be you possible for you something? to, yes, just go on ahead and, uh, and reshare that. All right, it says I'm sharing. Nothing. I'll try it a different way. And how does that look? Looks good. That works. Okay. And you're seeing the proper slide. All right, um, but before I do that, let me just point out a couple of things, a couple of resources we have. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the effort of this committee has really been about legitimatizing uh, the planetarium, um, both, both the science community and the visualization community. 
Um, and so a couple of resources in that area. Um, coming up at this year's IEEE Viz, which will be a virtual conference this year. So this is the foremost visualization conference. There will be an application spotlight, which is a new type of session at this conference um, about uh, visualizing data in a planetarium dome. And also uh, later, uh, coming up very soon, um, and you, I think we heard a little bit yesterday, but there'll be a special Immersa Day on, um, on visualizing hyper-local data um, in, in immersive settings. So uh, check those both out. And another thing I, I just wanna point out, uh, sort of an effort of the committee has been advocacy through uh, papers. Um, and so on, on the IPS website, there is a white paper section and you can find a whole series of white papers there. But here, there are a couple related to what I'm going to talk about today, um, including um, a really great uh, article that Tom Kwasnitska, one of our presenters, had a few years back in Nature. All right, so this is the lineup and I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And Tom Jarrett, are you there? I am here. Let's see All if right. I can get this going. Okay, do you see that? Yep, that's working. Okay, cool. All right, and you hear me fine. Otherwise, wave at me. Um, okay, thanks. Um, so I'll be your first Tom to uh, present here. And uh, about a year ago, I gave a, uh, a talk on the, the, uh, the work that we've been doing in our lab. And um, we've done a lot in that one in that one year, you know, the COVID year. And uh, I'll give you some updates on what we're up to. But I will spend the second half of my, you know, my five minutes on uh, VR to, to Dome. Um, a lot of that was carried out in 2019. But I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the details of that. So we created a lab to uh, interrogate large data sets that are coming down now, these next generation telescopes. And um, we particularly are interested in the three dimensional and the four dimensional data sets. And there are many in uh, astronomy um, and also the multi-parameter uh, data sets, which essentially dealing with big tables with multi-columns is that that actually visualizes very nicely um, in, um, in, in three or four dimensions. So uh, the sort of stuff we work with are spectral cubes, volumetric data, redshift catalogs, simulations, and so forth. Um, what we've discovered in the last few years is that the most promising technology is, is virtual reality. And uh, it's kind of like it's coming to a, to a fore here. Um, our research areas uh, that, that I'm particularly involved with are large scale structure of the universe, uh, galaxy evolution, um, infrared and radio astrophysics, uh, and, and visualization. Um, but also we do other, we work with other, uh, you know, interdisciplinary fields, molecular biology, neuro, neuroscience, um, comp science, and so forth. Okay, so, you know, the lab is quite active. Um, back to VR. So we, we uh, often like to talk about the promise of VR. It's been around for many years, the promise. Um, it's basically finally here. And I think it's here because the, the technology is finally caught up with our expectations. Um, and But the reason that we like VR as scientists is it's, uh, it's most suited to multidimensional data. In other words, when you work with the data in VR, it's natural. In prior careers, we're trained to work with flat screens in front of us, about two feet ahead of us. And that's what we're used to. But as soon as you immerse yourself, it becomes, uh, it, it kind of opens up opportunities. You, you engage your brain in a more optimal way, because that's what you know, humans evolved to, to work in three and four dimensions. Now, I don't have to tell you that because this is the, the Planetarium Society and immersion is, is what it's all about. So we like VR also because it, it, it combines both discovery and analytics. Um, uh, intuitive interaction, that's a big one with me. Um, uh, and we can display far more information than the usual flat screens. 
So, uh, and, and there's a lot of potential there. And we see this every year. We just see new things coming out of it and we're very happy. And right now we're, uh, we're pushing for what's called streaming or cloud VR. And we're developing that ourselves in the lab. Everything is open. We collaborate. Um, and uh, we give our, our software out freely and we talk to our, our, our partners about how, you know, and we, we partner with a, a number of different organizations. Now, a lot of the work that we've done in the last year or two has been in volumetric data and notably with what's called spectral cubes. And the reason is, is, is these are pouring down from our telescopes now, like the, the SKA square quantum kilometer ray. All interferometers do this. They create these amazing uh, multi-dimensional cubes, three, four dimensions more if you add polarimetry. But the, uh, the old standard way of doing things shown on the left is you need what's called slice and dice. You got a cube and you slice it and you look at it, different slices, or you maybe you'll rotate it 90 degrees and do the same thing. Whereas in VR, you can do it very naturally. You don't have to do slice and dice. It's there. It's for you. I'm showing an example on the right which is the M81 group, which is a, a beautiful nearby galaxy group, M81, big galaxy, bigger than the Milky Way, and um, M82, which is a starburst. And you're seeing the, uh, the neutral gas, the gas that, uh, the hydrogen that fuels the, the star formation and spread out all over the place because it's an interacting system. And you can see it very easily in three dimensions in VR. Very exciting stuff. So we developed this software package that we call iDavy. It's Immersive Data Visualization Interactive Explorer. And um, we've been using it for, for, for a while now. And we just uh, um, released a beta a version for our users uh, to work with their volumetric data. And you can do, you know, any kind of volume will work from astrophysical data to uh, uh, molecular science. Uh, for example, here's, the, here's a picture of a mouse brain to um, you know, health, you know, you can you can visualize MRIs and that sort of thing, and uh, we like we work with all kinds of data sets. And in order to sort of the, to to cope with all of this, we've divided it into three different suites. So we deal with particles such as tables, multi-dimensional tables, and it could be a it could be a large-scale structure, it could be a redshift table. Um, we deal with uh, the volume rendering, which I've mentioned already, spectral cubes, anything that's a volume. Um, and the third thing, which is what I want to talk about now, is uh, what's called VR to dome. And this is this is the brainchild of uh, my uh, PhD student, Alex Savitoli, who's here. I see a nice picture of him. And um, I'm going to uh, show you some stuff that we did in 2019. And uh, much of this is that it was through his work and it's, it's quite cool stuff now we we uh published a paper it's uh you can see it on astro archive and you can read about all the cool stuff that we've done in the lab in the last few years um, including the vr to dome and some of this the stuff that we we want to do in the future as well okay so now um you know mark just wave at me if you think i'm getting close to my time limit now I want to talk about the VR to dome. So the idea here is that we have all these great data sets and software that we visual that we use VR with. And um, and what you can do is you can you can you can you can um, stream that or you can you can connect a, a 4K monitor and you can see what what is happening inside the, the goggles on a 2D screen. So you, you the collaborator, you know, your, your group is standing around and you and the VR can actually say, yeah, no, see here, and you can point at it and so forth. And, and that works pretty well and that's okay. But <laughs> what you really want to do is immerse. You want to immerse your audience, your collaborators, whoever with you, either they can put on a headset and be with you or, a lot of people can be with you all at once. And we thought, wow, wow, this is gonna work perfect with um, a dome, because that's what a dome is, it's immersive. And so this is what Alex did, is that he said, okay, I'm gonna figure out how to do this. And, um, and he did figure it out, um, although it's, an, it's a bit hacky at the moment. And, and next year, right now he's just finishing his, his dissertation. 
Um, but next year he'll actually uh, get back on this and we'll see how this goes. So you're gonna see this. Now we demonstrated this at Colgate at the, um, the workshop they had in 2019. Um, and at the theater that we found, uh, they have a really beautiful facility there, just love it. And we found it just perfect for this kind of thing, for doing research. I love this dome because it's small. Uh, unlike my dome in Azico, which is you know fairly big, but also it, it, uh, I like this because it's tilted. Turns out I like tilted domes better now because it, it's just better, it's easier for research. And um, so this is, uh, so we actually fired this up and we showed this to people and I think it went down very well. So the, uh, the, the idea is that the, uh, in, in VR, you have your data set. Now I'm showing you a data set here on, you'll see it kind of moving around those beautiful particles. That's the two, two mass redshift survey. So that's, cos that's the, the uh, cosmic web, large scale structure in the local universe. So there it is. Blue things are near you and red things are further away. And kind of those big blobs in the middle there, blue are, is the Virgo galaxy cluster. Okay, so what Alex did is he figured out, okay, what I want to do is basically be in a godlike position. And I'm gonna show my data to the audience. The audience is down there in that little blue dome that you see. They're there, they're looking up. And so the idea is that the, the presenter says, okay, have a look at this. And, and he moves the data around. He can talk about the data. And meanwhile, let me see if I can do this. This is from the audience. So this is, uh, I don't know, maybe I took this video, I can't remember. But uh, here I'm sitting in my seat and with uh, 40 other people and we're looking up at the dome and you can see that the little goggles there, you can see the, uh, the presenter, which in this case happens to be my postdoc, Lucia Marchetti. And she's uh, running, she's showing, demonstrating the, the, the data. So imagine this is all around me now, you're, you're, in, you're in a dome. I do wanna point out here that in the background, you see those sort of funny clouds, those nebulosity, that's on purpose, is that we needed a, uh, we needed a reference frame that doesn't move. And this helps with uh, motion sickness. That's why that's there. We're, we will probably, uh, uh, try different ways of doing that using horizons, for example, that seems to really help. Okay, so that was that. Now, what are the requirements for this thing? So what we did was we dragged, we, we took our VR laptop with us and our, uh, our Oculus uh, Rift. And, um, and we have our software called iDavy, as you see, and you need to have uh, basically the Oculus software and Steam VR, right? Now I know that that's, many of you will know that means uh, you have to have a Facebook account, but I think that's temporary. Someday there'll be something better out there. But anyway, right now, that's what you have. And then you need an interface to the projection computer. So for example, if you're using a Quest 2, then you would use USB-C off to the, the system. So the system, what it needs is projection with video capture. Now I think most, Planetariums have this. Uh, this one in uh, Colgate did a beautiful 4K system uh, in uh, Izico's 2K. Yeah. Tom, you probably should start finishing up. Okay. And then uh, we hope that uh, someday they'll, we're going to try to do this through streaming. So you don't have to drag around your equipment. You just fire up your, your web interface and, and, and off you go. So um, let me just show you this graphic. Uh, again, so you can see from so from the eyes of the, the presenter, you have the you're in normal VR and you move the data around in front of the dome. And meanwhile, the dome people are looking up and they see the data. And ideally, you want your presenter to be somewhere near the audience so they can talk to the audience and and there can be some oral interaction. These are the issues. I think this is my last slide. These are the issues. Um, is that this is really just that you just show people your stuff. You can talk to each other, and that's probably good enough for most applications. If I'm with my research group, that's fine. Um, but that, but that's about it. It's a passive, a passive audience. Um, comfort's important. Got to be smooth. Um, vid capture, uh, I think 4K is necessary. It's Izico. We have 2K. It's a little too blurry. 
Um, the presenter, it's actually very different when you move your data around and showing it to be showing it to a, a dome, basically the godlike view. Um, and also uh, one little tiny little detail is that you do, if you wanna work in the pitch dark, you know, the dark of a planetarium, then you need to have infrared sensors. The, the rift doesn't have that, it, it needs a little bit of light. So Lucia, my presenter actually stood in the, in the light and, and, and did it. And I think I actually did the presentation. I talked about what she was showing. Um, I just mentioned that we are going to, we're trying to figure out how to do streaming VR. This is a real, real challenge and I'm happy to talk about this at some other point. But essentially, you you start with your your app. You start with your your monitor. You look at some data and you say, "Hey, what, what does this look like in VR?" And you put on your headset and and it'll pop up. And this data is coming from a cloud because you want a powerful computer doing all the rendering. Um, okay, so I think that was it. Yes, I uh, is it? We're we going to do questions, or we should we just keep moving on? Uh, I think let's let's uh, why don't you take questions in the chat uh, and. Uh... Tom Kwasnitska, are you there? Hey, um, thank you. So let me see whether I get this going. Here we go. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay, fine. so great. Um, Thanks for giving me a bit of time to um, speak to you again. So this will basically be an update of last year's talk. Um, as many of you might know, I operate a six meter dome, which isn't for astronomy at all. Um, I work at the Marine Research Institute and um, let, me, let me show you what we have. Um, this is our dome. Um, it's, uh, as I said, six meters in diameter. Um, variable tilt, five channel system with lots of add-ons. We don't have, apart from open space, any of the traditional software installed. What we do have, I'm gonna show you in a second. Um, just to give you an, an, an impression, this is what the place looks like. It's meant for groups of about four to six researchers doing interactive live visualization for their research. We don't have any regular audiences. This is really a visualization lab and not an open space. Um, so there's a lot of talk in our community right now about a concept called a digital twin of the ocean. Um, after doing this for 10 years, there's now finally a somewhat political push to actually get ocean science into the immersive realm. And they want to do it by building a digital twin. And I think it's quite interesting to look around literature, what a digital twin really is. Um, also in terms of the, in terms of what we do on our planetarium domes, because um, much of what we really do are digital models. I think that's very important to understand. And digital twin actually means that you have something digital, digital on your dome and as you manipulate it, it gives feedback to the actual thing. Now, obviously you can see how this is flawed because nothing we do in our dome will influence the world's oceans. Um, but it's interesting to um, have a look at how elaborate the visualization concept, uh, concepts get in our community these days. So this is from a large EU proposal that was actually um, turned down where you can see on the left, there's all the data sources and the different interfaces. And then the whole question of how you would have an interactive viewer that would give you any sort of benefit. And the, the important thing here um, in the scientific community that I live in is they want something hard, um, they, they want hard evidence, they want some, some measurable added value out of a visualization um, session. Just the epiphany of realizing something won't do it for this community. Um, uh, our director, um, who is new in the office, actually put out 
two goals for all of this, and that's enhancing enhancing of research workflows, get people together, make this a talking and and and, and teaching machine, but also um, definitely stakeholder engagement. So she wants whiz bang wowing media that she can use to drive further our agenda. Um, in the course of that, I'm going to show you a, a few developments that we have taken. Um, this is one of our more recent things. Actually, um, it's a sister working group of mine um, who came up with this web-based digital globe. Um, it's a, it's a web-based, entirely web-based um, data viewer. And in the last few weeks, they have integrated clustered dome mode in there, which is a pretty crazy concept. You, you have a five node cluster on each node, you open a web browser, go to a certain web page, load a calibration file, and there you have your real-time full dome system. I could hardly believe it, but it's, it works and it shows, it, showed, it shows fluid animation of ocean currents. So that's something that we're going to release in a while, I hope, um, and you will hear about it. The other thing is, um, as you can see in this example, we can basically take almost any OpenGL based um, application that is meant for the desktop and run it natively in our dome. You see in the foreground, the desktop application, in this case, a photogrammetry package that I like to use a lot. And in the background, you see the same graphics buffer on the dome, not pasted as pixels, but actually reinterpreted the way it needs to be for the dome. So how do we do that? Um, actually, we employ a commercial piece of software to do that. It's called um, Morvis um, by a German company called More3D. They take the OpenGL buffer. Um, so the, basically the, the recipe that the computer, the, the, the program creates just before rendering the image, um, and it takes it away from the computer and distributes it over the render cluster. And now you can do a couple of magical things because you're no longer tied to the software that actually produced the imagery in the first place. You can render it on a dome. You can have it in, in head-mounted display mode. You can have it in stereo, even if it never was in the first place. Um, you can combine it with tracking. Um, you can add your own geometry. You can start annotating. You can collaborate. Um, so um, much of the stuff that uh, Tom showed in the previous presentation is also possible in this um, in this framework. So we can bring in, although we never did so far, um, we can um, merge head-mounted display clients and the DOM client in several sessions or in, in one session. And we can also do compositing, which means we can not only do this with one software, but at the, si at the same time, we can basically Photoshop on top of each other, layer by layer, up to, I believe, five different software packages. Now that is actually no, no news. I talked about this last year. What is news is that we now ported this on our real-time node cluster. So we're no longer doing this with the two machines that you see here on the left, which are actually only our video servers. But we now have this on our high performance real-time cluster, which means we can in fact do all the things that I'm talking about here um, at high frame rates, which is now ready to be used. And that's a very exciting thing. It's been possible for the last 10 days. So another thing, um, as, as we say in German, do good things and talk about it. Um, the talking about it is actually the problem, especially in COVID times. So one thing I really, really, really want to do is dome streaming. Um, as I said, we have a five channel system and um, we want to be able to not just dome cast the way we've done this for the better part of 10 years, but we actually want to dome stream the infrastructure that we have in terms of software is pretty much unavailable, unavailable in this cocktail to anybody else. So we want to stream this to other places, not just for talks, but also for collaboration. And that means, of course, we have to take all the five channels, stitch them in real time and stream them out. And um, we are currently investigating how to do that. And I actually believe that we don't really have to write any new software for for that. I'm not totally convinced yet, 
but we've been looking into what FFmpeg can do, for example, and I see there is a chance for us to do that. Anyways, um, by the time we figured out how to do that, um, we'll be sure to release that to the community as well. Why would we want to do that? I mean, many, many software packages also for the dome are able to stream well. The problem that we face is um, that we have so many. And also, um, as you can see, we have two sites. Um, the, the mess that you see in the foreground of this picture is actually um, our institute. It's a small village, um, but we also have a second campus um, across the water, which we need to link. And that's actually where we operate an aquarium and that's where we do draw crowds. And we, so we, we need to connect those places. And um, in technically, we actually have an armada of applications that we can read today or readily or with very, very little effort bring into our dome. And we need something global to capture and stream this. We can't do it on the app level. So the idea that we actually have is we're gonna take away the video that goes to the projectors, stitch that in real time, because it's the only common ground that all these applications have and fire that out. We will see whether we succeed with that, but it's ongoing development as we speak. Um, let's see what else. Um, I have a PhD position to advertise um, and I'm going to wrap up here. Um, one thing that we hit in research the whole time is that people want, as I said, tangible proof and benefit of what they've seen in the dome. And um, that's what's called provenance research in computer science. So you want to know what you saw, why you saw it, what you did, when, why, and with whom. and um, there are frameworks like Vistrades, like I show here, that give you a node-based graph of all of these things. Um, but um, looking into the literature, I find that there hasn't been a lot of recent stuff done on this. So we, um, we want to do this. We want to do this in our dome. And we are currently desperately looking for PhD students to help us do that. Um, so if you are, or probably not in this round, but if you know of someone who wants to do a PhD in computer science in Northern Germany about this, be sure to um, make those people urgently contact me so that we can do this together. And that's it from my side. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Tom. That was amazing. Um, Lars, are you there? I am, I am. Thanks, Mark. I'll just take it away and uh, share my screen here. Let me know if, uh, if you don't see anything. Yeah, I have to say this was really amazing. I support uh, what's written in the chat. Uh, now to something quite different. We're not at the bleeding edge of, uh, of coding and, and uh, these visualization systems. Um, I am Lars Lindberg Christensen, and I am head of communications, education, and engagement for what is called NSF's Noir Lab. I'm also the IU press officer. Um, I just want to explain to you first what NSF's Noir Lab is. It'll only take uh, 30 seconds, but it's important. This is a new organization, and it's the first time that NSF's nighttime optical uh, infrared observatories have been gathered and united into one single organization. Um, our mission is to enable breakthrough discoveries in astrophysics and to share them with a diverse and inclusive community and as well also the outside world. And actually, as it happens, uh, let me go back to this slide here. You might recognize what this is, right? This is obviously the Rubin Observatory, but it is not, as some of you will have seen by now, a rendering. This is the real thing. So it's actually almost there. Um, very exciting times in astronomy. Our five programs are Ruben, it's Cerro Tololo in Chile, it's Kid Peak in Arizona, it's Gemini both in Chile and in Hawaii, and then also the Community Science and Data Center, which is underlying and threading through the entire thing. 
by integrating these uh, facilities, we are creating powerful capabilities for discovery, technology development. And what is very interesting for us here, of course, is STEM workforce growth and education. And we have more than 70 uh, telescopes, very diverse, very innovative, many small ones, but also very big ones. So that's a fairly substantial part of the US and world astronomy. Now, I wanna share with you some um, resources for the community uh, to make sure that you all have the, um, uh, the uh, information. I can also link to my presentation after this if I didn't do it in the beginning. No, I, I actually, I did. Um, we have full dome clips at Noir Lab. Um, we are only starting up the work right now. Uh, but we have actually up to 8K full dome clips. We offer 3D models and also an exciting project we're working on is 88 plus constellations as we call it, the working title, which consists of, as you can imagine, photos of the classical 88 constellations, but also images of the cultural constellations that we wanna share with everyone to go beyond this very Western centric view we have of the night sky. And these are high resolution um, assets and also they're stitched together to one very large 30K old sky image, which will be the biggest and best um, free old sky resource in circulation when we release it in, in a couple of months. We're working on many more things, especially right now, it's super hot with this multi-messenger astronomy taking everything beyond photons, gravitational waves, particles, and of course also time domain astronomy is very much in vogue at the moment as we're ramping up to the Rubin first light, which I think will really revolutionize modern astronomy. So um, I can show you a click, clip here um, of one of the resources that we have a very beautiful full dome clip of Gemini South done by uh, Kwon from South Korea, um, showing a transition from daytime to nighttime and back to nighttime again after a couple of exciting 8K minutes. I think you can imagine how the rest of this video will proceed. So I will cut it short and um, move to the next. I wanted to remind you all of the Data to Dome project, which has been around for a while, but continues uh, thriving. And this is a metadata standard for free distribution of planetarium resources. It doesn't sound very intriguing. I'll admit that anyone who's interested in the details can go to these links. And I wanna thank everyone who has been involved, especially Kevin Scott and Max Rosner, but also the many others uh, who have contributed over the years, of course, Ryan and also um, Mark himself. Um, so the idea is to have these descriptive standardized metadata and standardized assets as supports for the presenter in the dome. So concise, well-written descriptions, a precise license, very open, making it possible to use these assets. Uh, we have adopted astronomy visualization metadata um, as our standard. Uh, this was the standard I worked with Ryan Wyatt and especially Robert Hurt on. And we're distributing these flat videos and images and full dome uh, videos and, and more through this metadata standard. Now, the exciting part is that many vendors have jumped on the bandwagon and have um, included the standard in their softwares, everything from Datastar 7 and, and beyond. So 10,000s of images and thousands of videos and other things are available with the click of a mouse in the dome, um, which is really cool. And, and Evans and Sutherland really pulled uh, a very heavy burden in the very beginning, especially Kevin Scott. Um, so I'm, I'm deeply, um, uh, grateful for all that work. So the data providers are, of course, our own telescopes at Noir Lab. So um, you'll recognize Gemini, so to low locate P Rubin, and also very soon the US ELTP program. 
um, which you will hear more about in, in a couple of months. Also, we included the Hubble images when I worked uh, with Hubble and videos and also all the ESO assets. And Robert Hurt and collaborators have done this AstroPix project, which is really a quite um, unique and comprehensive um, collection of many other assets. Um, so you'll see the list is, is quite long and is growing uh, day by day or month by month. This is a screenshot of how it looks um, in Digistar 7, the latest version from ENS. And this is just one example of the many implementations that are out there. Um, I wanted to just uh, also make a plug for some other free community resources that um, I have uh, worked on over the years. Uh, when I was at ESO before, we did a very, let's say, uh, comprehensive um, production targeted exactly at this community. And there's just that one link that you need to bookmark. And there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of resources uh, available for you by the click of a mouse. No forms to be filled out, no difficult licensing conditions. You just click download and uh, wait until these sometimes giant files have come down on your hard drive. And um, finishing here, I wanted to just mention some IAU resources. We have the constellation diagrams and also uh, the IAU stake in this 88 plus constellations, as well as Hubble stake in this project. And on the Hubble side, you will also find some very nice full dome clips that are readily available to you. So that's all I had. And I can paste the link to the presentation again in a moment. Uh, so you have it already. Thank you, Lars. That was fantastic. Um, I'm excited about the, uh, the OSCI digital image because that's just been a, a huge need for this community for, for you know, more than a decade, and, and I, I can imagine that everyone will be using that. All right, let me um, let me share with you back to. Okay, and all right, slides are working again. Um, so. Uh, like Lars, I uh, recently, semi-recently at the beginning of the, the end of last year, I, I changed positions and left the Abbott Planetarium after 18 years or so and um, joined NASA where I'm leading the scientific visualization studio. And uh, there's a picture of the, the team, but you'll see that uh, I am not, I'm not in that group because you know we've been working uh, remotely all since that time. So we've actually, it's in the eight months that I've been there, we've never actually been all, all together in one space. Um, this is a, quite a remarkable uh, group though. It's been around for nearly 30 years, um, producing um, visualizations based on all areas of NASA science. And, and uh, people think of NASA, you know, in terms of space exploration, but of course the science really goes way beyond that. Um, and I'm sure many of you, I know I was, uh, are, are quite familiar with the SBS database. And so that's um, this record of all the content that's been created over those 30 years. And, um, and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what's in there uh, next. So, um, this is a project uh, that I just put a, I put a link in the chat um, back a, a few messages, but this is part of a summer project with intern we had. It was created some interactive visualizations about the SBS database. I think you may have seen on the last slide, there are over 8,000 items in this database. And, and we're often stuck with this sort of Netflix problem of when you have so many things, how do you help people find what they want? So this was beginning to create some visualizations that one of the things you'll see is that um, even though people think about space, when they think about NASA, certainly the work of the SBS has mostly been around um, earth science related visualizations. And you'll see that in the, the word cloud of keywords that pop up in our visualizations at the top. Um, and at the bottom, you'll see a, a stream graph which shows you um, 
in different sort of content areas, how many, how many visualizations have been released over time. And you'll see that uh, early on, it was almost entirely earth science and we've been growing to have a more and more diverse portfolio, but it's still, it's still about 50% um, of the output and uh, even more from my group is uh, in the realm of earth science. And so that means things like uh, things that are in the news. For example, um, we, we did a lot of work showing the impact of uh, the uh, COVID-19 lockdowns had on pollution across the globe. And so here you'll see some visualizations of that, of nitrogen dioxide levels and, and stratospheric ozone. Um, and uh, we are doing a lot of work related to climate change. So we have some recent visualizations about that. Um, what happens is a sea ice minimum visualization, which we uh, recently did a full dome render for, which we'll have out on our database soon. And uh, um, some other things, some of these are still in production actually, like the crop projections is, uh, actually that's unrelated, it's unpublished data. So don't tell anyone I showed it to you. Um, and so one question you might ask um, is, you know, like we make all this stuff, but who do we make it for? And uh, this was instructed to, for me to put together this diagram. Um, it might be almost be more interesting than me for, than it is to you, but, but basically there, there I think are three audiences. The general public is an audience, um, the science community is an audience, and, and policymakers are another audience. But we don't actually, directly reach those audiences. So those interactions are moderated. Um, and in fact, the Scientific Visualization Studio itself uh, actually has a sister group um, at NASA, which is called the Conceptual Image Lab. And we break down that work by the SVS um, creates visualizations based on actual data or simulations or numbers. Um, and CI Labs will make conceptual animations of, of topics. So they do more traditional animation. So together we kind of create a portfolio of work. Um, some of that goes uh, directly to the public, but not, um, not directly from us. So there is a, there is a production group which will turn that into narrated uh, video pieces, pieces for social media, pieces for NASA TV, and we reach the public that way. Um, and the three groups that are circled there, the SBS, CI Labs, and Goddard Media Studios, it's actually the content of those three groups that uh, lives in this database. So the database contains more than just the SBS, the SBS database, and that, that's something important to understand. Um, but there, there's probably the main way that we reach the public is not through the NASA channels, but it's, it's through the SciComm world. And museums and planetariums make a big part of that world. So that's our primary output is not directly in the content we create. It's people who remix and reuse uh, our content. Likewise, we, um, we, we create contents for scientists mostly through an, our immersive display, which is a, a tile display wall, which we call the NASA, NASA Hyperwall, which travels um, uh, to most of the major scientific conferences around the world. And it's really um, through them that we, um, the presentations using our content mediated by the scientists that we reach policymakers, you know, around the world, um, I would say. Um, so given that we're not directly reaching the public, um, what we really create and what you'll find on our database is, is content that's meant for creators. So, so um, there are things meant to remix and reuse. For example, a couple of that are probably very useful to this community um, is a, 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 a digital uh, deep star map. Um, uh, and this is, this is recreated from catalogs. And in fact, um, um, Ryan Wyatt uh, just uh, requested that um, we create a version of this without the bright stars to be used as a background imagery. And uh, you got an email about six minutes ago, uh, Ryan saying that's ready. So, um, so it's there to download now. Um, there's this uh, CGI moon kit, which is a great way if you wanna make your own 3D models of, of the moon. Um, but in general, for every visualization we produce, we, um, 
we put all the assets that went into creating that. So we, we were putting out rendered, pre-rendered content, but the different components, we, we output frames, we output um, things like color maps and labels separately. So you can combine all these things in layers and remix that however you need. Um, check out our database. You'll see things like collections of items, galleries like this. Um, you can search on certain keywords. We have a small amount of planetarium content, um, uh, but but that's growing. We have a, a few pieces, and you know, with my coming on, of course, I'm committed to doing more and more immersive content. Um, we're also, in addition to the full dome formatted stuff that you see here, we have a, a number of things in 360 video formats as well. And um, we've also produced a piece for this upcoming planetarium show uh, about climate change uh, that's um, being produced by Spitz um, Creative Media, and that's called Atlas of the Changing Earth. And um, here's a little clip of the, the piece that we did. It's uh, got some fantastic uh, visualizations, uh, not only from my group, but uh, especially from um, Don Cox's group um, at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And of course, it's a very uh, timely topic. So um, I encourage you all to uh, check out this show. And I am going to stop right there. Um, and uh, we've reached uh, we've reached the end of the time. I want to thank uh, my other presenters in this session. Um, and uh, I guess I'll hand it over to you, Michael. Thank you, Mark and Tom and Thomas and Lars. Thank you so much for the, the presentation and the session today. Uh, that brings the official portion of uh, VCon day two to a close. Uh, of course, our, our last uh, group of sessions is going to be on uh, Friday, and that is, I'm going to make sure we get this exactly right, it starts at 1700 UTC. That's uh, the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, EDI first, um, the Portable Planetarium Committee, and then we'll end our 2021 VCon with an update from the History of the Planetarium Working Group uh, and some of the exciting things that they have in store, uh, often in collaboration with the Centennial Group. So a lot of great stuff happening there. Uh, we will be keeping this room open, uh, but first,